So I'm going to get right into it because everybody is here. Um, Christina, we good? You're recording? Yep. All right. We are on. And so I'm going to switch up my view here. Get comfortable in my Zoom. How do you guys like these things via Zoom? You guys all zoomed out yet or what? No, it's fine. Everybody, everybody ready to get back to in in person learning? Yeah. That would be better. Yeah. That would be so much better. Yeah. The uh, the energy in person is great. I know Ronnie could attest to that as well. I had a uh, I had a I had a speaking gig that I did um, a couple months back. And I get there and I knew that it was going to be like a virtual thing, obviously, because of the times here. And uh, so I got to, I got to, I got to stand on stage to talk to an audience full of seven people. And I had to stare right in front of a camera <laughs> and like the seven, like there were three people here, four people here. And like one of like the, like the janitor guys walking around. And I'm like, I don't even know what the heck I'm doing right now. So but I, long story short, knocked it out of the park, thankfully. Of course you um, did. So uh, welcome to Ignite session five price to sell uh, with your CMA. And so just a quick background around the whole pricing thing. There's a, this, this is something that I'm super passionate about um, in terms of pricing. And this is, you know, this is probably one of the most important parts of the entire process when you get a listing is to price it correctly, right? Whether it's a low market, high market, down market, up market, it does not matter. Anything else, you have to price it right. Because even in a crazy market, like we're in, presently, um, if it's priced incorrectly, there's a good chance it's not going to sell. And when a house doesn't sell, um, who wants to take a crack at the first person they blame on why it's not sold? <laughs> yeah, real estate. And, and, us. and look, good, bad, indifferent, whether they're right, whether they're wrong, at the end of the day, we're not the ones that set the price. We educate on the price. They're the ones that agree to price. Um, however, it is our job to to accurately represent to the best of our knowledge, to the best of our ability, um, what that price should be. A um, couple things, like a couple housekeeping things really quick here. So, you know, over the course of the last couple of weeks, you guys had, uh, you had spoke about leads, prospects, sellers, uh, creating appointments, and, you know, this pricing ties everything in all together. Um, so today's expectations, we're gonna study some market fundamentals, we're going to discover uh, top pricing strategies. I'm going to show you how I price homes, um, how I kind of love to, you know, dive into the data and the, I don't know what call it, like the secret sauce behind it, uh, but, you know, how we can actually, how we can actually take a, a, a very repeatable process and apply this to every single seller, every single listing that we get. Um, we're going to learn to do a CMA uh, in, in terms of breaking up into groups. You know, Ronnie, I know you had mentioned on one of your sessions, it's, it's hard to, to kind of do the group thing um, and, and, and be, you know, super collaborative in, in little groups um, in these Zoom classes. However, what I really want in one of my, my biggest things, especially when I train, is I love the engagement, whether it's Zoom, whether it's in person, whether it's whatever, the engagement um, the engagement is super helpful. So I would ask that you guys mute for the majority of the time. Uh, but if you do have a question, if you do have something that you want to talk about, by all means, uh, speak up, unmute, raise your hand, however you want to do it. Cut me off. I'm totally cool with it. No hard feelings. Uh, so either in the chat box, raise of hands, or however you guys would like to let me know um, who here is doing their 10 contacts per day. I don't do that many, I don't think. Okay. How many are you doing? Um, anywhere from three to five. Okay. But I'm at the point right now where whenever I'm contacting people, the conversations are pretty long, you know? So like, I'm trying to figure out how to like sh shorten them as much as possible, you know, to just kind of not get straight to the point, but to not, you know, draw draw out any, any, any further than I have to. Okay. And that is, um, that's super understandable, super respectable. Um, can I ask you a question? Sure. Why do you want to shorten them? Because whenever I get on the phone with somebody, you know, I probably haven't spoken to them for, for a long time. So it, it's all about catching up and, you know, finding out what's going on with their lives. And some of these conversations could be like 45 minutes to an hour and a half long. Got it. So I'm trying to shorten it to maybe 15 to 20 minutes. 
you know, that way I could be efficient with my time and with their time. Right. And so I, uh, I, I, I challenge you, okay. uh, on your next conversation where you think this may be a, you know, 45 minute conversation or, uh, you know, a fill in the blank, however many mm -hmm. you think is a long time, um, conversation with somebody, when you go to call them and just say, Hey, I wanted to call you quick. I only have five minutes. Do you have a couple minutes to chat? Got it. I only have five minutes. Do you have a couple minutes to chat? You've all, you've, you've subconsciously said that you have five minutes to talk okay. and you're asking them if they have a couple minutes. Got it. Means, they're going to talk for two. You're going to talk for three. You got your five minutes. I guess my issue would be that I don't want them to seem like as if I'm just calling them because, you know, of the, of like my career or, or the real estate. I want them to like know that like I actually care about what's going on in their lives. It's not just about me. It's, it's kind of it's kind of where I'm stuck with that right now. Awesome. Cool. And again, I, look, I love the fact that we're having this conversation and I'll, I'll be I'll be completely honest with you. If you call up someone thinking that you're going to bother them, you are always going to have that thought when you talk to them. So if the conversation is two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, 50 minutes, that's still going to be like your thought. And so if you actually make it short and if you're just like, hey, I just want to see what you're doing, right? Like in bold, and I don't want to make this about another class that it's not, but we talk about the Ford sandwich, right? And you talk about family, occupation, recreation, um, and their dreams. So, um, and then ask for the business, right? Or let them know that you're in the business, just as a friendly reminder. That's all. Never think you're annoying. That's the one thing I could say, because you know what? The one time when you think you're annoying and they go list with somebody else, you're going to be like, man, I should have said blah, 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 blah. Right. Or I should have just said something about real estate. And at that point, now you're, now it almost, now it almost puts you kind of like on your heels. Next time you go to talk to somebody where like, you're like, all right, now I got to mention it. You know? Yep. Um, just some, just some food for thought. Uh, let's see. So we got a couple people. So we got Fred at five. We got Pedro at five. Uh, awesome. That's good stuff. Um, so let's see in terms of, we got Sharon at three. That's awesome. So are you guys doing five and five a day, three a day, uh, something, you know, since the last session, again, just, just trying to get a gauge. All right. Five per day, it's awesome. Okay. Sharon's calling three folks a day, that's awesome. And again, just going back to these, these chats here, um, before we even go into the whole CMA part, the reason why these calls are important, and I, I always tell people, like especially new agents, I met with somebody yesterday who's gonna be uh, um, who's going to be joining on here. These things, these are our hammers, right? So like in a trade of, you know, in a trade of real estate or in a trade of fill in the blank, whatever that fill in the blank is for somebody, right? There's always a main tool. This is our tool. One percent. Where we, where this thing comes with us, this is our business. This is our tool. Um, the ability to pick that up and speak to someone or the ability to pick that up, text someone, and, and, and just have a conversation with them, right? And you don't have to always throw in a realtor, hey, if you know anybody, hey, if whatever, right? If you could brand yourself to the fact where people know that you are a real estate agent, no matter what you do, when they see you, when they think about you, they're going to think about real estate, right? And that is the ultimate goal. The only way, and, and thank for, for me, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, Ron on this call and any, anybody else that's been in this business for a long time, um, they, they ultimately know that the amount of people that think of them when they think of real estate is what determines their success. And, and that is, that is the end game. So like all this CMA stuff, all the, you know, all the, uh, you know, the listing appointments, the pre-listing packets, and, you know, like I love Ron's whole thing from last session with the pre-listing packets and going to take a listing as opposed to going on a listing appointment, like all that super important. However, if you don't pick this up and you don't call people and people can't relate you to real estate, there's not going to be anybody to use that stuff on. And so I know Ron, um, you know, Ron went, went pretty deep into this last session as well. And so I just want to reiterate that too. 
again, some housekeeping stuff here. Um, we really want to focus on those 10 contacts per day. And by contacts, those contacts could be just, just anybody, right? Anybody that you have a real estate related conversation with. So, um, so anyways, that is, that's my spiel on that. And I believe, Christina, are we able to, uh, we're able to cut um, for a few minutes for some, some prospecting time? Yes. Okay. And so we're going to give this a second here. Because I just want to dive in, man. Like, I literally want to get into the meat and potatoes today because the whole CMA thing, like, is there is no question about it. Like, that is something I am super, super passionate about. Um, let's see. Cool. All right. And so we are going to. We're going to jump into this prospecting time here. Um, Christina, if we could. Yes. Okay. We have, so we have 20 minutes of prospecting and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to DJ this here on a limb. If anybody wants to, and this goes down to the accountability factor, the accountability factor um, in real estate Again, we're, we're not employees. Nobody's telling you to go and, and do something because your paycheck depends on it, right? You have to go and do this yourself. Um, and so what I want to do is I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to see if I can hold somebody accountable here. If anybody is willing to um, prospect here on Zoom live, I will give you a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me um, and ask me anything just that person or, you know, a couple of people here together, you guys and me, um, and we can go over anything you want. And again, I'm throwing that out there. You know, Christina, I, I mentioned I was going to be doing something a little, little off the cuff here. Um, and I wanted to have somebody actually prospect on this Zoom. And I just threw in the coaching thing for 30 minutes here. So um, I would love to see that happen. If somebody wants to step up and accept that challenge, I am, I am more than happy to. Uh, to, to help you guys out and, uh, and be able to do that here. Anybody up to it? Anybody? Not even Ron. Sean, I'm up for anything, anytime, <laughs> anywhere. Let's go. Right. And so nobody wants to make calls here for 20 minutes live on a Zoom. And I, I'm totally cool with that. No pressure. Really no pressure. Sean, I just got a lead. I'm going to make a call right now. That's legit. <laughs> All right. And so, guys, our hammer, a.k.a. our phone, is our most valuable tool. So let's just remember that. Um, Christina, I, I do want to take that time for prospecting here because that's what the class calls for. And that's, you know, and this, this, is, this, is a, this is an action class. Um, and if, if I was to skip that, I feel like I wouldn't be doing my job here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. So we got 20 minutes to make calls. I would love to hear the results of these calls. Um, if you guys are to get anybody that you feel, uh, you feel is a hot lead, anybody that you feel is a call, uh, worth a follow-up, I would love to hear about it. And then we're going to jump in to, uh, to today's class. All right. Smile and dial. You guys want some music? All right, Fred's crushing it. Sharon's up there too. Abe's got that phone in his ear. Awesome.
Antoinette, how are you? Hey, how you doing? Here, wait, hang on one second. Hang on one second, Jason. Hey, Antoinette, how are you? We're actually, we are in our, um, we're in our, our 20 minute prospecting session here. Um, oh, I just got to a home inspection, so I want to catch, catch a little bit. <laughs> got it. You missed my little intro here. Antoinette, would you prospect, would you prospect in person on the Zoom for, for a 30 minute coaching session with me? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. It's all good. It's all good. So, I, ooh, there you are. Yeah. Hold on. Um, Let me have a Cool. We yeah, will. I, uh, I just got to a home inspection, so my my jacket's still on. Got it. We will. Uh, we will be reconvening at one ten um, for some pricing strategies here. Okay. So, what did I miss in the beginning? Uh, just a just a recap from last week, going over what the expectation is for this week. Um, and then there's 20 minutes for, uh, for making the 10 calls and, um, just getting our minds right. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm at this inspection. So I'm going to just, I'm going to take my video off and I'll do thing. It. All right. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Thanks. Thanks for joining.
One of my favorite lines ever of calling people is, hey, I'm just, I'm just calling a check-in. I'm just calling to touch base. Did you see that the interest rates are starting to climb? Let that, let that begin a conversation. Oops. Hi, Tiffany. Do I do? Let me just... For some of the new people on here, there's a um, there's a website called Keeping Current Matters. If you go to that, they actually have free content. If you ever need any ideas on what to talk to people about, KCM, my uh, Keeping Current Matters, definitely great stuff on there. Feel free, check it out. Um, you can use it in your social media, uh, use it in a phone call. Again, you need to pick up that phone. Dorinda. Yeah, you know Dorinda? Oh, yeah, I know him from the fucking uh, Boy Scouts and shit. Or is it Neil? Oh, yeah. You know him from the Boy Scouts.
All right, guys, we got about five minutes to go uh, before we really dive into the session here. I see you guys cranking away, which is awesome. I just put my first offer with Keller Williams into attorney review. Nice. Let's go, Fred. One of many to come. Nice. And a boy. There were 35 offers <laughs> on that property. And we weren't the highest. Sometimes it's not about being the highest offer. Nope. Right? All right, guys, we're going to wrap up in about two minutes here. Sean, I got to jump off. I got to do an interview with Eric Melnikoff. I'm going to try to jump back. Sounds good. Now I just need, need to learn how to get the KW paperwork into the system. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the secret. That is the secret. Okay. It's a good problem to have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Always. Wait, 
All right, guys, just a minute to wrap up here. I'm I'm trying out this new Zoom uh, system I got here with this TV on my wall, as opposed to sitting down, and I am digging it. So I'm gonna have to put a desk in the middle of my uh, my office here. All right, guys. So let's wrap uh, let's wrap up these calls here. Good stuff. Does um does anybody have any ahas from these calls? Any issues? Any uh, any issues in terms of trying to talk to anybody? What to say? How to say it? And, and I don't. I'm not making this about prospecting, but I do. Uh, I do value feedback, and I do value um, helping agents as much as I can here. Anybody? Chat box. Speak up. Either way. Well, I guess I could just tell you what happened. Um, so it was a good conversation. I put it out there. Um, um, no one's moving right now or selling, but I did like ask them to please, um, you know, keep me in mind. And I told them how wonderful Keller Williams is and how much social media exposure we get. And say la vie, we'll see what happens. Awesome, that's good stuff. Because the whole key of this, and look, I'll be the first to tell you that I can't, I can't just take every single day and sit in front of a computer and just sit there and pound the phones and do nothing else because I have so much stuff going on around me that I have to be very intentional with every minute of my life. What this is about is creating the habit. And I can tell you, you know, I, I'm, I, I seem like a, at least I tell myself I'm a fairly young guy. And I've been in this business, I'm going on 18 years. So almost 20 years in the business. And I can tell you, even at a very young age of 22 years old, I had no idea what the heck was going on. Um, uh, that creating that habit, and this is, this is, this is pre-kids, pre Sean, I would get into the office super early and just sit there and dial at 7.30 in the morning. And I look back now, I'm like, who the heck was I even talking to at 7.30 in the morning about real estate, right? Like now if somebody calls me at 7.30 in the morning, I'm like, what do you want? Like, I don't even answer. I'm like, who, you know, and, and I just know what goes on inside of my house at 7.30 in the morning. And I'm like, man, I was calling people back then. It must've been chaotic for somebody to answer the phone back then. And back then, those are the days before text message. Those are the days that everybody actually answered their phone when you called, right? And so now there's different means of communication. There's different means of delivering your message or speaking to people or figuring out a way to just get into people's heads and say, hey, how are you doing? By the way, I'm a real estate agent. I would love to help you out. And, and to Abe's point before, if you're thinking that you're being annoying by calling these people, you are going to come off as being annoying. So I would love to like scratch that record and completely eliminate that association from these calls for you guys, because that was something that was very difficult for me. If you call and know that you are going to create value within your gut, within your heart, within like your, your, your internal, everything that you have, you're calling that you really know you can help these people Right, like for example, Sharon, by you saying how awesome Keller Williams is, like you really believe that in your core, and I'm sure you do. And that probably comes off in your conversations, right? Like 
if you're going to sell your house, you've got to list with me because I'm with Keller Williams, the best company in the world, right? And so that is how you're going to portray yourself. That is how they are going to portray you. If you call and you're like, ah, I don't want to bother somebody. When I call them, I'm probably going to tiptoe around and try to like not really bother somebody. They're like, what do you want? Just tell me, right? And so like, it's almost like you're bothering. So I challenge you the next time you do these calls to really be intentional with how you are speaking with somebody and how you, how you want to be perceived on the other end. Because ultimately, that's how you're going to be perceived. Make sense? So, so Sean, Yo. um, I just got the phone with two of my friends. Um, one of them I know is he's, he's about to be in the market to, 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 to either sell or lease his current condo in Morristown. And then he's going to be in the market to purchase um, a place with him and his fiance down in East Brunswick soon after. So I was, I was able to set up a meeting with him Thursday evening to kind of like to catch up, you know, I hang out for a little bit. And then I talked to another friend of mine who does small real estate investments that I'm actually going to meet this evening at 7.30 after, after I did his class in Jersey City. As a result of this 20 minute thing yeah. that I wasn't even going to do. Just, just, just for calling them, seeing what's going on. You know, if, if you guys want to catch up and, you know, just hang out for a little bit and then we could just talk. Awesome. You let me know what your schedule is next week. You and I have a 30 minute session one-on-one. -on -one. Sharon, <laughs> oh, wow. you want to jump on that? You're all good too. <laughs> all right, cool. Thanks. So awesome. you, guys, uh, you guys knocked it out of the park. If you guys want, and I'll, I'll throw this out here as well. Um, it'll most Take likely be, on. it'll most likely be like either Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Those are probably the best days for me. If, if anybody wants to have a convert, if anybody wants to have a 30 minute conversation offline, um, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, to just kind of, kind of shoot the breeze about real estate and any questions that you guys have. I'll put that out there for, for everybody, even though nobody took me up on my coaching offer, but, um, it's all good. Cool. So we're going to jump into, to, to the meat of this class, right? I didn't want to make this about prospecting. What I wanted to do is just create the habit. Uh, this is going to be my second time teaching Ignite. First time I taught it was actually live. It was pre-COVID and people set appointments as well. And, I, and, and this stuff is like baked into this plan. And I didn't want to deviate away from what Gary Keller put out for us. So this 20 minutes of prospecting, as much as I didn't want to do it because it was on Zoom, I'm like, you know what? I have to do it because I feel compelled because somebody put this here in this because I'll be honest with you, because it works, right? Like this works better than what I can put in something. Like somebody a lot higher up than me who does things at a high level, put this in here for you and for me to teach to you. So I, I just wanted to stick with it. So um, so that's awesome. I'm glad you guys got some results here. So that's, uh, that's amazing. All right, so we're gonna jump in. So, uh, so one of the biggest things when, when we start talking about value and we start talking about pricing and all this other stuff here, um, a lot of it, a lot of it has to do with presentation, right? Like it's how, it's how you present it to the seller, right? And, and just like when you're making those prospecting calls, how you perceive yourself and how you want your seller to perceive you is going to be all about like your, your internal, like this is a, a straight up mind game, right? There's science behind it. There's process behind it. We'll go through that. You know, there's, there's strategy behind it. At the end of the day, you can make numbers either way, right? You can make them go up, you can make them go down, all depends on the comps you pull, depends on what you pull as comps, uh, depends on your criteria, depends on so many different things. Um, and so what we wanna do is we wanna keep this, we definitely wanna keep this uh, as repeatable as possible. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to make my life a little easier here. Um, so I'm not, straining my head, trying to look at my TV. Um, all right, cool. So again, a lot of this stuff, pricing has a, has a large mindset component to it. And, and, and again, it's for both you and for, um, for your homeowners. So pricing is definitely a process. Learning to do it definitely requires knowing pricing strategies based on principles that drive markets, also requires uh, knowing price tactics, building a uh, building and presenting a comparative market analysis, and the scripts that go with it. Um, you're going to use your knowledge, your expertise in pricing and presentation, 
to win the seller's agreement on the list price, a price that will actually get their house sold. So we're in a we're in a very interesting market right now. And the market, obviously, you know, 37 offers or, or whatever it was. How many how many offers was it? 35, 37? Whatever that was, where's my buddy Fred? He's on mute. So he just won a he just won a, a a bidding war with 37 offers or 35 offers, whatever the number was, and he wasn't the highest price. So on the on the seller side, I don't know if you guys saw any of Bill's videos with pricing. Uh, I'm sorry, with uh, with winning the offer, winning the bid. It doesn't always come down to the number. Same thing on the list side. So when you go to get a listing or when you go to take a listing or when you're on a listing appointment, it doesn't always come down to price. It most of the time comes down to value. A lot of the times it comes down to price and then ultimately commission, which you know we're, we're not getting into. This is a price conversation today. So, um, so if we were to take that and think about how this whole thing's ha this whole thing happens. There's a couple of different ways to price it. Like there's make it happen, make it happen pricing, which we're going to dive into uh, here. So with make it happen pricing, um, it's it's really becoming a master of pricing it correctly, right? You have to understand how the markets work. You have to understand supply and demand. You have to understand local market conditions and the pricing criteria. Um, so how markets work, right? There's two principles about markets and value provides, uh, markets and value provide a great foundation for pricing any real estate. So you go look at market dynamics. You have to look at how the markets operate. They operate on a, on a law of supply and demand, right? Supply is high, demand is down, prices go down. When supply is low and demand is up, prices increase. So there is this determination of value and value is established based on an agreement between a willing seller and a willing buyer. It's a tug of war, uh, always has been, always between the buyer and the seller. It's what the seller wants and what the buyer is willing to pay. That is regardless of the market. If you have a down market, it's, you know, the, the sellers on their heels chasing the market down. When you have an up market, you basically just send over a blank contract and say, hey, seller, fill this in with whatever you want, right? Um, so I'm, I'm curious, and I, you know, I, I know the answer to this, and I believe most of us know the answer to this. What is the current supply in our market here? What do you guys feel? Go ahead, shout it out from the rooftops. The supply is low. Supply is down. Supply is down. Supply is actually down, and I'm going to show you. Let's see if I could... Uh, so we could jump into something really quick. This is off the cuff here. So we're gonna DJ this. Um, we are going to, this was something I put out yesterday that someone had sent to me. I don't know how many of you guys follow me on social, but let's see if I could throw this in here really quick. Um, all right, check this out this. This is a chart of the supply of the number of homes for sale uh, nationally between 2015 and 2021. So this is on a national scale, but I can tell you um, as, a, as an international coach, I have coaching students in Canada. Um, I have coaching students all over the country here. As an international coach, I can tell you this is everywhere. It's not just New Jersey. It's not just Wayne. It's not just Northern New Jersey. It's everywhere except for you know, a little asterisk, New York City, right? Like everybody's fleeing out of there like crazy. Um, but this is like, I talked to people in Canada. They have, they have maybe 10 homes on the market in their, in their, in their region where they are, Barry, uh, Barry Canada. Um, so this isn't just a problem here. We look at over the last six years, it touched, let's say it touched 1.5 million. Now it's at 448,000. So we have one third the amount of houses for sale, which is, which is crazy. So if we look at that from a perspective of supply and demand, now we understand why you go to an open house and there's 40 people online trying to get in because you know a good open house is 10 people, right? And if we're down two thirds of supply, let's do the math. And depending on the price range, 
the lower price range, that number goes up tremendously, right? Because there's just a lot more people in that lower pool that can buy. So, um, so just understanding the supply and demand value of it, here is, here's a big factor. And again, being in this business for a very long time, which I like to think is a very long time, um, I still feel like a, like a, like a rookie in it because it's, it's fun all over again. But so if we look at the, um, if we look at the market, let's call it 2008, right? When the numbers were staggering with houses on the market the buyer pool was down here. So that had to push the prices down because nobody were, nobody was buying the houses up here. So if, if the people that were selling those houses still have to sell, again, it's cyclical, it's a market, like it's, it's just, it's the dynamic of how it works. If nobody's buying up here, they have to lower the price so that the, the demand can meet the supply. It's like going to Best Buy to buy a TV. If, if you know, one model is not selling, what's Best Buy going to do? They're going to run a sale, right? And so they're going to have to lower the price. Same thing when it comes to, um, same thing when it comes to, uh, to, to real estate. Um, so we're going to jump into local market conditions. So to price accurately and to price to sell, you must constantly study the conditions in your local market and in the specific neighborhoods where you want to specialize. Uh, some basic factors to watch inventory, days on the market. Obviously we know what inventory is, how much is for sale and is inventory rising or falling? Definitely a good thing to know. Days on the market, how long it, it's actually taking properties to sell. Price per square foot, very good indicator um, and changes in the local landscape. So with the changes in the local landscape, but you want to major, you, you want to, you want to monitor changes in major employers, shopping, schools, uh, services in the community, and changes in the local laws that impact housing. So um, just for example's sake, like here in Wayne, um, whoever here is from Wayne or like these very surrounding areas here, uh, one of the things that has been going back and forth is the low-income housing. Wayne had some stuff set aside for low-income housing. Uh, they were paying into some low-income housing fund. Um, long story short, some stuff expired. People really pressed like, hey, you really, you really need to set up some uh, low-income housing or affordable housing. Um, and so Wayne had to dedicate a certain amount of numbers to low, uh, to, to affordable income housing. I keep calling it low income housing, but it's actually affordable housing. Uh, and so what they had to do, they actually had to go, they had people come and try to sue the town because we have a lot of vacant properties here. Like we have, um, and I'm, I'm at my desk here, so I'm looking at the, the mountains over here, but we have, um, we have Toys R Us. We have a huge empty bank. We have a huge empty mall. So there's a bunch of these empty places. Now they're like, well, hey, you need to fulfill your requirements. Um, we're gonna sue you because you're not zoned but residential here, but you need to fill these requirements. We're buying these properties and we wanna build here. And so what happened within the local market here is these people won and they are now approved for these low-income housing or affordable housing units. Um, so that is going to change the landscape of real estate here, right? You're going to add another 5,000 units. A lot of them are, are buildings and like the Avalon, like all these other things that are going to come into town. So now you're going to have these, these buildings and a portion of those buildings have to be, um, have to be reserved for, for the affordable housing. That is going to have an effect on prices. No question about it. So if you own a condo in let's say Brittany Chase, um, that is 25 years old, and a quarter mile down the road, you're going to have something that is nearly similar that's going to be brand new in the middle of, you know, retail and, you know, the, the Preakness, uh, Preakness Shopping Center. That's going to affect your value on, at Brittany Chase, right? And so knowing that and knowing what's going on in the local area is definitely, um, is definitely super important, right? And so price per square foot um, just to touch on that for a second too, price per square foot is really good because with all things equal, like if you're gonna look for an equilibrium, you can use square feet, right? And so price per square foot, um, that'll vary depending on a lot of factors. Number one, most notably would be condition. Number two is location, or you could you could interchange those one and number two. So it's gonna be location and condition. Um, I could tell you that appraisers use price per square foot more so than 
than any other, any other, you know, like they don't care about the inventory. They don't care about like days on the market. They'll take that stuff into consideration in their calculation. But if you have a house that sold for, you know, 500,000, that's 2000 square feet. Then you have a house that sold for 500,000. That's a thousand square feet. This house technically is double the price per square foot. That's going to raise a red flag. So uh, again, price per square foot is, is, is a good equalizer. It allows you to compare one to one in the equation for value. Um, so again, a, a very good indicator. Um, so let's see, pricing criteria. Uh, getting the facts about pricing means evaluating a given property against other comparable properties. This, mean, this means comparing your client's 20 year old, three bedroom, two bath property in a neighborhood of similarly built homes with homes that sold recently that match or come very close to matching the particulars of their home. Following factors come into play when looking for comparable properties, location, size, amenities, and condition, right? Those are, um, those are super things to focus on when it comes to value, because again, you're gonna compare one to one and one to one. That's always what you're trying to do, apples to apples. Um, what do you guys use for a source for this information? No trick question. MLS starts with three letters. MLS. <laughs> MLS. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, what a lot of a lot of agents do not put square footage on listings, right? Where do where does the public get the uh, the square footage out of? Tax records. The public. Go to the town, and ask. I guess right. Now, so yeah, the public gets it from Zillow. The oh. public gets their get the public gets their 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 square footage from Zillow. So what Zillow does, and look, love them, hate them, whatever your feeling is about them, Zillow as a company is very smart, right? They want to give as much knowledge as possible to the consumer, because for a very long time, real estate agents did a very bad job of doing that. Is what it is, right? And that's another, that's, a, that's another whole whatever for a class. Um, so there is a site, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug it here in the chat box. This could actually arm you guys as well. Uh, where is my real estate stuff? My screen is small here. So this is really good. So I'm gonna give this to you guys. So when I go into a listing appointment, give me one, why is this not popping up? Uh, we are. Grr. All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to share my screen for some reason, because my screen is shorter here with this. This is, um, let's see, so we're going to go here. Uh, so you guys are on that this is my old email. All right, so let's say we go here. Square footage for listing. Where is it? Where is it? Here it is. All right, so can you guys see um, the square footage thing here? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, cool. So um, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna put it in the tax, uh, in the chat box rather. So this is, uh, this is, I guess it's from Monmouth County. I don't know, I've been using this, I'm gonna say probably for 12 years now, probably maybe like 10, 12 years, 13 years, somewhere around there. So this has pretty much every county in New Jersey in it. Um, and it's fairly accurate and most of the data is in here. So uh, I, I believe it's like the NJSTB or NJTSB, whatever it is, I'm not 100% I'm not sure. All I know is I go to a website and I can pull up square footage. So, uh, so if I'm at a listing appointment, let's say, and I wanna pull up, um, let's see. So I sold this out, 38 gates. This is in here from when I sold it. So if I wanna pull this up and this guy's like, hey, what's the square footage here? I can go here. I go to more info and then I have, for some reason I got a chat here. And so I got the square footage up here, right? So I have all the information right here. Um, I'm sure there's a way to do it on one of our tax maps somewhere along the lines. Um, but again, to be competitive with Zillow and know what you're talking about. And if you wanted to uh, uh, compare square footage, this is a very simple website to go to and you have everything right here. So your square feet, I'm just gonna know how to read this thing, 4,000, 4,005 square feet. And honestly, like I highlight that when I go to a, uh, to a client's house. So I'm gonna take that, I'll put this in the search box. 
by all means, feel free to uh, feel free to use it, mess around with it. Uh, let's see. Any questions on square footage or anything so far? Okay. So again, just just to just to touch on the whole Zillow thing, right? They have the information, and your client is going to Zillow for the information. It's good when you're in a listing appointment or with your client that you can easily pull this up, and. Um, and show this information to them too, right? Like, because if they're like, hey, what's the square footage of this house? And you're like, I don't know. And they're like, well, that one's 2,500. And they're like, well, how did you know that? It's from Zillow. They know it already, right? So you go to pull it up from your phone. You're like, here, I'll tell you right now. You could easily do it, right? And so it's just a, just another little piece to be armed with. Um, I saw Pat here. Yeah, townhouses will be affected a lot, 100%. Pat texted that um, regarding the townhomes with, uh, with the Wayne Market. 100% townhomes would be affected a lot. So yeah, so again, just knowing what's going on around us is uh, the awareness is, is worth its weight in gold. Um, cool, so if we were to, um, if we were to look at our own local market stats, um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Where are you guys? You guys have your workbook with you? Christina, do you, do, uh, oh, are you able to pull out the workbook here for them? So we can go over this stuff? Uh, I uploaded it to the file section oh. of uh, yeah. Facebook. So I can download it and then um, also plug it in the chat. Here, you know what? I'm going to do this. Uh, so I'm going to share. I'm going to share here and we'll go through some of these because these are, uh, in my opinion, pretty helpful here as well. Um, okay. So what I want to do is just go through some of these two. Uh, so current local market statistics in our targeted areas. So if we were to look at days on the market, and then it's, uh, so let's see, am I able to, tell me what you guys see. Do you see my MLS? Yes. Okay, cool. So I could switch back and forth here, Facebook I don't need anymore. All right, and so we're gonna go this, go through this one by one. And this is, this is gonna be some powerful stuff for you guys. Um, so if we were to, let's say, you know, what are our current local market stats in our targeted areas? So I'm gonna use, uh, let's say we use Passaic County, for example, right? If I wanna go in here and just look at Passaic County and see what our market stats are. So first we need to determine what are the current local market stats in our, in our, our target areas. So if we're to look at days on the market, we need to think, are we talking days on the market for actives? Are we talking days on the market for solds? So we need to define a specific period of time or a specific sector in terms of, um, hang on one second, I just wanna mute somebody here. Hang on. Being disruptive. All right, so what we wanna do is we wanna make a, Where's my stuff again? All right, so what we wanna do is we wanna make a, like a determined period of time. You guys see my screen here, we're good? Cool. So we wanna make a determined period of time or a determined status on how we're gonna look for days in the market. So most of the time, most people use the sold data. So I'm gonna uncheck all this stuff. I'm gonna to go to solds. I'm gonna tell you um, why I, I don't think solds are the best indicator for value shortly. Um, so if we go to solds, closing date, one, two, three, four, five, six. So let's say we want to go back six months. I'll put the first. And if we want to define, let's say we want to define a price. Um, you know, let's say I want to define what are the days in the market between 300 and 400, which, are, you know, if, if there was a way to be in the negatives, it'd be in the negatives. Um, and so what I do is, and this is super helpful too, here's a little nugget for you guys. When I go to run 300 to 400, I don't put in 300. I put in 298. Why? Because every realtor lists stuff for 299, 299, 900, 299, 988, 299, whatever, whatever somebody tries to use to be cute. I just want to make sure I get a little below that so I can actually paint the real picture. Because I guarantee you, if I just put in 300, 
there's going to be a huge bulk of properties that I miss. So, um, and I run the list price. I don't run the sold price because I want to see what they actually listed for and then sold for. If I just put the sold price, it's going to eliminate what it was listed for and just show me sold price. Uh, so then I jump over to max. So same thing with max. I go to 402. Right? And for lack of a better term, this is 300 to 400. I go 2,000 bucks over because who knows, maybe you get some crazy realtor that lists something for 401. They try to be cute. Do people do it every time? Likely not. But I just want to be able to capture that one time where I don't skew any kind of numbers that I'm going to represent in full transparency to my client. Um, so, and then we search that out. Oops, we said say county. So we're going to do, so let's say county. And we just want to see what the days in the market are. Uh, so that's 800. So clearly we're going to just run a town as opposed to the county. I'm sure there's a way to do the county as well through reports and analysis. But for our comparable purposes, chances are we're, we're running a CMA, we're creating value within a town. So I'm going to, let's say, I would say total, but there's probably not a lot because the market's so dry there. We got 28 houses between 300 and 400 that sold. Chances are you got some townhouses here. There's ways to filter that out as well. For our purposes right now, I want the entire town. I'm not going to be biased on what kind of property type, subtype, or any of that stuff, right? And so I would just go here, click this. You can actually view. Uh, you can go to client CMA here. And this will break down everything for you eventually. There we go. Um, so if we look at the town address, so some of this stuff is important, isn't so important. So if we look at list price, average list price, 353.865. There was $10 million of inventory sold between 200 and 300. Um, and then sold price, 360.928. Average days on market, 43. And then one of these things here, so this is the differentiator in the MLS. So this will tell you if something sold under asking, over asking. Um, I wonder if there's an equal sign for at asking that I've actually never, never even thought about. Uh, that'd be interesting to know. So uh, if it sells above asking, you see the plus sign here. Here is the key. And here's something that I explain to people all the time that is a differentiator for me um, that I know going against people. I know there's days on the market continues to run when properties are in attorney review. So this number here is actually a pretty skewed number because we're relying on someone else on the other side, another real estate agent or their admin or an office admin to change the status of a property when it goes from active to under contract or, or an attorney review to under contract. These days keep on moving you know, this, this 293 here, if you guys are still looking at my screen, if, if, this, if the agent on the other end put this in attorney review at day 150 and didn't change it to under contract till day 220, even though it was under contract within two days, these numbers are skewed. And so I always say, take these numbers with a grain of salt when it comes to days on the market. However, it's pretty accurate um, when you look at all things equal. Like same thing here. If you look at the, it works the same on the on the uh, on the converse side as well. So if you're looking at this house that's been on the market for six days, understand that this house wasn't technically on the market for six days. It went into attorney review, and I, I love bringing my laptop with me on listing appointments because I pull back the curtains and I go through all this stuff with them because I know nobody else does. And what this does is this sets me apart at the kitchen table with people and that's how I get these listings. So if you look at the listing archive here, we know that this house, let's say it was listed 722, my cousin's birthday, went into attorney review 724. So realistically, this house was on the market for two days, right? 22, 24. It went under contract on the 29th, actually out of attorney review, but they went into an agreement two days after this property came on the market. So for lack of a better term, that house on the market for two days. So again, just this is this peels back the onion and, and, and opens up on how these numbers could be skewed. And I go through this with people at listing appointments 100% of the time. 
So um, just keep that in mind when you're looking at all this stuff here. So now if we go back, um, so we look at days on the market, right? And we look at the average price per square foot. The average price per square foot, I'm gonna screen share with you guys again. So if we, let's say, I'm gonna put you back on here on my desktop. You guys see my MLS? Cool. All right, and so now if I go back to my square footage for listings, let's take, let's take the same example. Let's take Five Meadow Drive. So Five Meadow Drive, let's pull this here. Um, five. So let's see, so Five Meadow Drive, this guy bought this house, let's say, we have a sold price of 380. Right, so I'm going to take three hundred eighty thousand dollars. And then I'm going to go look back. So this thing is one thousand two hundred twenty eight square feet. On situations like this, I round this up to twelve hundred thirty square feet. OK, so we're going to use twelve thirty. Uh, we're going to use twelve thirty for an example. Now guys, I'm gonna be honest with you. Here's a little secret. I am not perfect, okay? So when I pull this up, there's a good chance I'm gonna screw this up the first time around and that's okay because I love to show people that I'm not perfect. So if I do $380,000, right? I'm gonna divide that by the amount of square feet that will give you 300, actually, Guys, I guess I am perfect. This will give you $308 per square foot, $308.94. You could run to $309 per square foot. So this house sold for $309 a square foot. For a cape, that is bizarre. <laughs> so just part of my language, just being in the business wild, knowing what these things are. They're typically around like a, in a, in a total market, 250 to 300. Um, 250 to 300 bucks, 300 being on the very high side, 250 being on the, on the fairly low but moderate side. Um, and that's how you get your price per square foot. So if you wanna compare apples to apples, if you, were, if you were in a place where like you knew nothing about and you're like, hey, how can I, how can I quickly try to figure this out? that is the equalizer, price per square foot. There's no question about it. You could take the assessed value, you can compare assessed values. There's so many different ways to do that. I call that real estate theory when you're actually looking at what the assessed value is because tax assessors are supposed to walk into houses with neutral eyes. So on paper, there's a way to figure it out, but somebody might've done a kitchen without a permit or a bathroom without a permit. So that increases market value, but the town assessor doesn't know about that. So he has to compare it with a neutral eye. You might walk into a house that, that part of my language, it smells like, it smells like dog poo, right? Like that is going to affect market value. That's gonna bring that down. So that the, the, the assessed value, which a lot of people like to use is not an equalizer. Price per square foot, immediate equalizer. That's why the appraisers rely on this so heavily. So um, just some good info. Uh, this is a little kind of off the cuff here. And this is, this is me peeling back how, how my mind works when it comes to pricing this stuff. But um, so knowing average price per square foot, definitely, uh, definitely super important. How many homes on the market now? Super important as well. Um, let's see. You know what, guys, because we don't have, um, because we don't have this thing right up here, I'm just going to keep this screen share. If that's okay with you guys, unless you guys love looking at my face. Uh, so how many homes on the market now? That's easy, um, but I'm going to show you how to do it. Ronnie Ayosa. Ronnie, we're letting Ronnie in. We're guys, we just let Ronnie in. Don't, don't talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Ron. We love you. My um, man. Um, so, so here, so if we're looking at like what is, uh, what's available on the market, I'm just going to 
let me dumb this down just a little bit. So we go into county, we're gonna go Passaic, we're gonna go status, we're just gonna say what's active on the market. Um, and let's say, again, we wanna use some kind of, um, some kind of filter, right? So we're gonna use a price filter, we're gonna use the same, we're actually, we're in way now, so we're gonna do a different filter here. So we're gonna say, uh, so we're gonna say 400, which again, Sean uses as 398, it's 398. Uh, to 500, which we're going to say 502, right? A little bit under, a little bit over. So we want to capture those people at 399 and, you know, the, the, the cute agents that do other stuff here. So what we have, we have 103 properties, which you saw in the beginning. A key to note, what I used to do a while back is I would just look at this and be like, all right, cool, there's 103 houses on the market. Now, because there's so many different statuses within the quote unquote active status, we have seven coming soons. And then we also have two under contract continue to show. And again, when I bring my laptop on my listing appointments, my goal and the one thing that I always play on with my sellers is, hey, I wanna show you exactly what we use when we list properties to be transparent. Because I know for the majority of the time, the other realtors aren't doing it. They're bringing in paper comps. They're walking in there saying, hey, I'm going to be here for 20 minutes because I know I'm getting this listing. It's going to sell for a full price. They're like all the stuff that everybody else says and sees, I want to differentiate myself at the table, right? I want to be the memorable person. So I take the time to go through this stuff. And if I was going through this and, and, and they asked me, hey, how many houses are on the market between, you know, whatever the price range you just put in, four to 500. I would go through here. I would explain, hey, of these 130, you have the coming soons. And then I would also point out these asterisks. Obviously, if, if you guys are new, this means the property is in attorney review. Um, and so I would also note that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I would go and count all these. These are a lot of properties in the review. I would go and um, and let them know that all these properties are in attorney review. And I would just realize that this is not just Wayne. This is also Passaic County. Uh, that's why I didn't click on Wayne. So two seconds. Not that the town matters. Nothing changes um, other than these numbers. Right, so from 100 and whatever to 16, which is very more realistic. So um, still one, two, coming soon, under contract, continue to show, uh, and one, two, properties in attorney review. So if we look at that, if you want to get a very clearer indication on how many properties are technically on the market, what I would do is I would select all, narrow down, so technically there are 11 properties in Wayne on the market between 500, uh, I'm sorry, 400 and 500. But overall of the 16 that show in the MLS, two are uh, coming soon, two are in attorney review, one is under contract, continue to show. So, um, so that's to show how many homes are on the market now, right? And so again, I'm doing this from a, from a perspective of you want to really paint the picture of transparency here because if you don't give them the right information, they're going somewhere else for it, AKA Zillow, right? And so you want to show them as much as possible because the information's out there. Like we used to be the conduit of information. A wise man once told me that his name was Uncle Bill. And you say, we are the conduit of information. We're not anymore, right? And so now we have to justify what we do and that we have access to other stuff that that Zillow and all these other things that they can go on on their phones and their computers can't tell them. Like Zillow's not gonna tell them properties that are in attorney review, right? It, it, Zillow just doesn't do that. Like Zillow doesn't tell them that the property's uh, under contract continue to show. It'll tell them it's coming soon. It'll tell them the square footage, which we don't have the access to the square footage, but I just showed you the secret where to find it. So now what I want to do is like level the playing field between you and what they think they know, right? So um, so also we got uh, sources for local market statistics. Um, local market statistics are great. You can go to NJ Realtor. There's a couple different places for them. If you're a member of the NJ MLS, um, come on. So New Jersey MLS, 
you can go into here. There are, let's see, norm violation policy. So they're in here somewhere. I know, and they also send out emails. I always check the emails. Um, toolkit, flyers, calendars, general mail, watch lists, form stocks, info. So let's see. All right, so we're just gonna do it this way. They are typically in the newsletter. So I'm not going to go through my whole email, but there is a place to find it. Uh, let's see if I type in stats. Nope. I know I look at it every time. And this is what we just looked at. There's definitely a place for it. This is actually, this is gonna, this is gonna irk me. So let's see, member tools, Supra, listing alerts, prospecting, hot sheets, senior reports. It's gotta be in the toolkit here somewhere. Let's see. Anyways, they put a thing out every month. So that's definitely a good place to go for, um, let's see, there's gotta be a way, has to be a way. We're open house roster toolkit. I would think it's either in toolkit or desktop and I'm just not seeing it. Um, yeah, let's see, nope, we don't wanna read about the Narva. Is it, I'm no. sorry to interrupt you, is it up top that says listing maintenance and then it says stats right by feedback? There you go. Thank you. Mm. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. You're hired. Um, so customer report, uh, I'm sorry, current report, click here for reports. So they do all these reports. That is a great eye. So you got quarterly market update, uh, monthly market indicators. So uh, so I don't believe they put out anything in 20, let's say I got January 2021 here. <clears throat> so these come in. They're local, you can do local to your town. They do local to the county. Um, these are really good stats depending on, um, you know, obviously where you are, where you're pulling. They go month by month. Um, NJ Realtor puts out the same ones as well. They use pretty much the same exact data. So these are always good. So this will show like months of supply of inventory. Um, total market inventory there's just there's there's tons and tons and tons of good stuff in here and i like how they break it down like they show you single family homes they show you town homes they show you dual communities um that's great on the local level i'm not even going to try to find an nj realtor site actually i'm going to give it a shot i got to give it a shot i believe they make it fairly easier, let's say research. Where's the research? <laughs> uh, so you got monthly housing stats here. This is cool too, because they actually show you like member profile stuff. They'll show you buyers and seller stuff. Um, so, but these are good to compare with what is going on in the country. So we have, you got public and kind of reports. This is cool because you can actually go right into, like you could go right into Passaic here, Passaic County, it gives you the same thing. And then it also breaks it down, single family, townhouse, condo. This is a little bit more, um, just kind of more direct. Um, I know in NJMLS, you can actually break down by town as well. Uh, it's good to show the entire state. And then again, you go by reports here. So that's cool. And then KCM, is keeping current matters, which is also, uh, which is also another great site as well to get national data. So this stuff is good for more like promotional type stuff. Um, but this is really good to compare to show how we are doing 
um, in comparison to the rest of the country. So this is just taking a little longer to load here. This is actually a free site. You do not have to be a member. Um, the stuff that I get with the member stuff is whenever I put something out, it's branded. Uh, so you got social graphics, you got buyer and seller guides. This is actually really cool too. Um, personalized content. So you go to social graphics. This will put stuff out with home prices, with interest rates. Um, you know, there's there's some good little, uh, whatchamacallits in here, just little like tidbits you can put on your Instagram and all that kind of stuff. Um, pricing wise, there's some stuff in here that you just got to sift through. Uh, this will actually give some, some stats on buyers, who's buying, where they're coming from. So that's also pretty cool. But we're gonna keep this about the CMA for today. My KCM or KCM or, or just Google Keeping Current Matters and what you'll be able to get from there is, is honestly, it's invaluable. You can take it, put in your social media. You can take it, put in your listing packet. You can take it, build it into your CMA um, and then just be able to compare. So, so I'll take a few minutes here. Um, any, uh, any ahas, anything that you guys have learned here that you guys want to share or anything, any questions for me that you have? We covered a lot. Anybody? Ahas, what'd you learn? Anybody learn where to find square footage? Yeah, that was that was great, Sean. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, and then how you ran to find out like the, the average days on the market and the average price home. I didn't, I thought it was new for me. So I appreciated that. Got it. Cool. And also, remember also, also a good trick that you showed about, you know, if a home is so is, uh, between 300 and, and, and 400 or whatever, how you put 298 to 402. That's perfect. Got it. Yeah. That stuff works guys. It definitely works. If you were to, um, if you were if you were to just put let's say 300 and 400 all the 299 stuff is not going to come up so filters filters are definitely key um and you know just uh just you know something to remember that when you're when you're in the mls it's all it is the database like it's a big database on the back end so all that stuff that you input you basically, you're just excluding what you are not including in those prices or numbers or bedrooms or whatever, right? So it's just, it's, if, if you wanted to, like, it's, it's just a change of one number that can change the entire dynamic of what your search results are, right? So just keep that in mind. Just keep that in mind. I also, um, it was interesting to know that the assessed value isn't the equalizer and that you should use the square footage. I didn't know that. Yeah. So assess value, like let's say um, that's a that's actually a very 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 good point because a lot of people like even when I go on listing appointments, people say the same thing. Look, like, my house is assessed for you know X Y Z, and they're like it should be worth X Y Z. And I'll show you there. Like let's take Wayne for example. We have I'm going to pull this property on Ledge Road. So this house on Ledge Road is assessed um, is assessed for two fifty eight. So the total assessment for this property, if you take the building assessment for 122, the land assessment for 136, you come up with this value of 258,500. This property is listed for 479. So some towns, when you go into the tax records here, uh, let's see, I don't think, so NJMLS always has the equalization ratio for the town. There it is, Sean. You were just on it. It's 48.03. 48.03, right? right so, okay, so you got the tax ratio here. So technically, according to this, if in a, in, a, in a very simplistic world, the value of this house or the value of any house in Wayne, for example, would be double its assessed value. So at 258, uh -huh. so let's call it 260, right? So let's say this is 50%, 48, again, for simplicity purposes, we're gonna say that it's 50%. So you would technically, in a perfect world, you would take this and just double it. So 260 and 260, right? We're gonna just round that up a little bit, is 520. Right now, this house is listed at 479. It's been on the market 10 days. 
This is a situation where if you were to take the total assessment, multiply it by the equalization ratio, you would get what this house is likely going to sell for. So, um, so there is a little bit of a science to it, but I would not hinge all of my, my bet on that when I'm at a listing appointment. So that, that can, that can make you look very silly, very quickly. So, um, especially in a market where things are like, where, where, where pricing almost doesn't make sense. So, um, cool. So we're, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, so, you know what, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen because this is super powerful here and this, let's see if we were to go. So pricing principles and strategies. Um, so it's important to grasp the six critical strategies that set the stage for using pricing criteria effectively. Right. And so there's, there's probably a little bit more than six, but we're going to follow what this has here. Um, so you got to know what sells. Right. There's 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 a there's a finite amount of homes on the market. There's a finite of homes that sold. Right. And so the data that you can actually see, figure out, grab and be able to articulate to somebody else is 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 very determinable. And so you got to look at what you can determine it with. So um, there's a little point when doing the listing if it does not sell. Right. There's an obvious point here. Um, and to get a home sold for the most amount of money, the least amount of time, it must be priced in the market. So there's two determining factors. You got price and you have com uh, condition. Competitively priced properties must present in the best possible condition outside and inside the home. Again, we're in a little bit of a, a unique situation where we are, um, where, where some of that stuff kind of goes out the window. Again, being in this business back in the in the last boom, this is definitely a little bit different, but it is eerily similar um, in terms of people just not caring what they're buying and they just want a house. So this, uh, this graphic here is probably one of the best I've ever seen, right? So when you're looking at condition versus comps, if your condition is very similar, as you, as you move down here, it gets worse and worse or uh, you know, different and different uh, in, a, in a bad way. So and you're looking at price here, if your price is either at or below the lower down here, and as you go above, this is the sweet spot. You want to price within the condition and within the comps, the further you go outside of condition in the negative, um, and the further you, higher you go in the price in the, I'm gonna call it, it's, it's the negative positive direction, right? Because going up, is technically positive, but in the negative way where you're overpricing the house, you become in no man's land, right? And if you go too far, you are now out of the market. And once you're out of the market, that's a dangerous place to be in because like we mentioned in the beginning of the, the session here, when the house doesn't sell, ultimately, who are they going to blame? You, right? And even if you're at a listing appointment and they pick the price, they're blaming you because you didn't market it right, right? So no matter what, somehow, some way, the blame always comes down to you. And so number two, you have to know what the seller and you can and can, can, can't can control. <clears throat> An important part of the pricing process, help your sellers understand that agents and sellers do not determine the price of the home. Instead, the market determines the price. <clears throat> the pri pricing to sell is based on understanding what is selling. Use the simple dialogue below. So here's a script, Mr. And Mrs. Seller. Some of the things you can control during the selling process are the condition of your property, the availability of your home for showings and your positioning in the market, AKA the price. In the end, value is determined solely by what a buyer is willing to pay in today's market based on comparing your home to other homes, to others currently on the market for sale I don't determine the value, neither do you. The market determines the value. Does this make sense? And you let them answer. And in your own words, obviously, right? What this basically comes down to, and I'm gonna stop my screen share here and, and talk to you guys. I'm gonna, I'm gonna DJ this thing off the cuff here. And I'm sure, you know, Ron can attest to this as well. Um, there might be properties that that are priced right, that are just impossible to get into, right? Like I tried to show a house yesterday in Pines Lake. I couldn't get into it for four days, 
four days. And I was finally able to get into it yesterday. And the guy's like, hey man, we just got four offers today, right? And so regardless of me being able to get into it, they still got offers, right? And so again, we're, we're in a very unique situation, a very unique market that even access, um, you know, for example, say a month ago, I listed a house in Upper Greenwood Lake. I don't do a ton of stuff in Upper Greenwood Lake. I listed this property as a coming soon. We received an offer for 12% over list price before anybody can even get into it. So access didn't even matter there, right? So there's always these examples on, you know, this is pretty much the standard, but there are deviations from the standard. However, I always tell people the three things I, that we can control. We can control price, we control how people can show it, and we control the marketing, right? Because ultimately we control the marketing. Um, so just understand that, you know, even, even in a hot market, some of these things may or may not make sense. However, in every market, there's, there's like an underlying core, underlying foundation that, that, that's just never going to change. And this is a lot of it. Now with Zillow owning showing time and how that's going to work, that is yet to be determined um, because now, you know, your search portal also has control of access. Right, so there's a whole different play there. Um, so you know, just be aware of that. Take this script. This script is great. Make it your own. Put your own words into it, um, and then you go on to the next thing. Here is understand that there is a huge window of opportunity when you list a property. The best chance to sell a home is when it first comes on the market. Period. End of discussion. If it's priced right, comes on the market, it's gone. Right. That's when. All the people that are sitting here waiting for a property to come on the market, something comes on the market, they all just go to it. Like they have to because these people are all trying to buy a house and there's no houses, right? So they all gravitate to that, even in, a, even in an equal market, right? Even in a fair balanced market. There's only so many things that have been on the market. There are this, this, this pool of people, again, something comes on the market, they just gravitate to it. Their phones start pinging, the alerts start coming in, the auto emails start going in. They want to be the first one in the door. There's a there's a there's a sense of urgency to be the first, right? And so that's why pricing it correctly from the start is the most important thing you could possibly do. Um, sellers need to be clear on this. Uh, there's a window of opportunity that opens and it closes quickly. Um, I'm going to show you this graphic here. It depicts the interest uh, of a buyer. Let's see. I'll go back to share my screen here. So if we look at this, we look at the, these are weeks on the market. Um, not days on the market, even though we can, we could probably in this market link this to days in the market, but these are weeks on the market. So in the first two to three weeks, I would even shorten that down. You even got the first, you know, the first week here is really the most powerful, but the first three weeks that it's on the market, this, this demonstrates or this shows that it actually peaks in week three. I mean, I, I don't even think that that's the case anymore. I think the window of opportunity is these first two weeks. If a property isn't sold in those first two weeks, then it's like, all right, you know, we've, of course, depending on snow, depending on Christmas, depending on, you know, whatever, whatever the holiday is, the main holiday. But for the most part, this window is two weeks nowadays. And then really, once you get to that three, four week period, it drops off tremendously. And on here, once you get to that fifth, sixth week, it's a, it's a straight decline into week 13. And, you know, I, I say this all the time, you know, every realtor is always posting on Facebook, hey, you know, sold, um, you know, within three hours, 20 offers, all the other stuff. And, and that's great. And that's what everybody's posting. And I always want to say, like, I always say, show me the, show me the post, like on the market, four and a half months, total nightmare, got the property sold. Like that's impressive to me because almost every house is selling in the first two or three weeks. Right. And I'll tell you these, if you don't, if you don't, if you're not transparent on price and you don't convey the right message up front and have the right price up front. The conversations after week five and week six and week seven with your sellers, they get harder and harder and harder, right? Because you have all this, you get the honeymoon phases done. 
you guys talk to each other all the time. You're like, ah, we're getting an offer. We're getting an offer. No offer comes in. We're getting an offer. You get an offer. You can't negotiate it. All right, we're getting another offer. We're getting another offer. And before you know it, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks has gone by. And they're like, why, why, why isn't the house sold? Right. And now you're in this position where you have to talk about price again. Ultimately, in my opinion, and I think the people, the people that have been doing this for a while would attest to this in this market, if the house is not sold in the first two weeks, three weeks, we'll call it, it's price. It's without a doubt price. If you've had a lot of people through, if you have nobody through, it's hard to have that price conversation because then they're like, well, where are you marketing it? And then that's where you have to be very good at objection handling and saying, hey, we're here, we're here. We've done everything we could do on our end to get in front of X, Y, Z eyeballs. And now you have to, you almost, you almost have to defend your position, so to speak speak at that point. That's why pricing it, it right correctly in the beginning completely eliminates that conversation later on. And if you're having that conversation four, five, <clears throat> excuse me, six months down the road, that's an even harder and harder and harder conversation. And I'll be the first to say, if you're supposed to call somebody on a Tuesday to check in and you don't call them on Tuesday, you're like, ah, I'm going to call them Wednesday. Wednesday comes, you're like, ah, you know, it's towards the end of the day, Wednesday, I haven't called my seller yet. By the time Thursday comes, you don't want to call them anymore. Before you know it, it's Monday. And you're like, man, I really got to call them. And then you create this whole thing inside your head. Like, I know I got to talk about price. I know I got to talk about price. Before you know it, it's Thursday again, and you haven't spoke to them. So the law of diminishing intent creeps up real fast when you pass this four, five, six week threshold of the house not selling. And when I mean law of diminishing intent, that is the law of calling your client with the intention of talking to them about price. That's why I do it in the beginning. One of my lines, I know it's in this book somewhere. Um, it's, it's a part of one of the scripts. I tell people all the time, I'd rather you hate me now than me lie to you and you be mad at me later. Because all it does is suck energy out of our day and it, it puts us on our heels and we're very reactive as opposed to being proactive. When it comes to this stuff, when you're not proactive in this business, when you're reactive in this business, and again, I'm going to circle that back to the beginning of when we talked about habits and prospecting and making these calls, it, it all ties into that, all ties into it. It's energy. It's what you do. It's, it's making that habit. It's being intentional with your time. It's, it's all, it's all everything. It's crazy as it sounds. Um, all right, and so we want a price to reflect market movement. Pricing requires facts and numbers, yet it is also an art, an art of persuasion. Choosing the right comparable properties is a huge step. It's massive. It's a huge step in the right direction, but there's much more to it. Your job as a listing agent is to help your sellers understand how the right price impacts the marketability and the saleability of their home. Marketability and saleability are also determined by the following, market direction. Is market going up? Is market going down? Is it appreciating? Is it depreciating? Market speed of change. How quickly prices are changing and what the rate of change is. So if we look at that for a second, <clears throat> again, being in the business for a very long time, seeing the crazy rise of last market, seeing the crazy drop of last market, seeing the crazy rise of this market, I can tell you I have never seen a real estate market jump 20% in one year before my life ever. And, and again, been doing this almost 20 years. Uh, I've studied the market 20 years prior to me coming into the market. Like I saw what that was like. I know the boom of the eighties, the night, like all that stuff. Real estate is known for its stability. So when you take a real estate market that jumped in one year, 20%, 12 months, that is unheard of, right? It's like cryptocurrency you know, um, which is bizarre. So if you look at that and you want to be on top of market speed of change, um, the market is crazy right now in terms of a rapid pace of change going up. Also to keep in the back of your heads as well, what gets built in a day can get torn down in a day. So I can also remember back to 2008, when we're like, all right, you know, it's, everybody's here, bidding wars, all this stuff, lines out the door for open houses. 
And like one day, it's like, where'd everybody go? Like, it felt like the party stopped. Next thing you know, it's, and if you look at a chart, any of these charts, it fell fierce. Like it definitely fell fierce. Granted, there were so many other factors that came into, uh, that came into play. Um, just something to keep in the back of your head. Not looking to scare anybody or create any fear here, but it happened in the day then and it happened in the day now. So, um, but just be ready. But anyway, to keep this on in line with price, you want to price it at the market, right? And you, you have a listing, you want to be in tune to what is going on with prices, right? And so now let's say you have that same townhouse in Brittany Chase and Wayne, next thing you know, they're starting construction right down the street to start these other buildings and your, your listing hold. It's time to start reducing that price. What's going to happen as these go up and the builder starts putting up for sale signs, everybody's flocking to there and you're going to be, you're going to be on the back. So again, keep, um, you know, you need, you need to keep your pulse on the market without a doubt. Uh, don't chase the market price ahead of it. Your ability to be knowledgeable of the current market pays off when it comes to any kind of shifting market, shifting up, appreciating or shifting down, even in a stable market. My honest opinion, I don't think we're in a stable market. We are in an appreciating market that, that has some pretty extreme volatility. I would not call it a stable market whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> it's actually extreme volatility in the opposite direction. Right, because you can't even you can't even find a house. Like it is, you know, to be an accepted offer in one of 35 offers, it's like winning the freaking lottery. Right. And so think of that from the buyer's perspective. That's why listings are so important. Because when you have the listings, you're getting paid, right? You don't have to be one in 35, you're one of one. So keep that in mind. Uh, so in a rising market, sellers who feel time is on their side may want to price above the current market and hope the market will catch up. Saw this so much 2006, 2007, you know, 2005, it really started. Um, eerily similar vibe, but again, is what it is. So uh, in hopes that the market will catch up, bring them the price they want, provided the market rise. Sellers who want to cash in on improving prices in rising markets will still uh, are still well advised to price at the market to get a sale now and move on with their lives. Um, so I'm going to also share this graphic here. So this is also a great graphic here. So you have the average home price, and then you have time on the market. So if you price ahead of the market, right? So let's say this is the equilibrium here, right? This is your, your, your equilibrium. Let's say you, your seller wants to price the house up here. It's going to take longer for them to be on the market. Whereas if they actually price in the market, obviously, again, this being your equilibrium, you're on the market here. This is when you're selling it, right? If you want to price it a little bit ahead of the market, your time in the market is going to be a little bit down here. Okay. So all depends. You're going to get a lot of people that say, Hey, I'm not in a rush. I'm not in a rush. Okay, great. We don't know what's going to happen with the, the, the market tomorrow. Um, in a declining market, when prices are falling, and this isn't a matter of, it's a matter of when, when prices are falling, sellers make a huge mistake by pricing too high, hoping to attract the offer they want and thinking they will drop the price later if that strategy doesn't work. The reality is that most sellers who do this never correct enough to keep up with the pace of reality, keep up with the price of reality and the pace of reality. So uh, sellers who price right will get the buyers while the listing that's chasing the market down will take longer to sell. This was huge lingo back in the day, chasing the market down, right? Because right now sellers are chasing the market up. It's, it's not even, it's not even a, it's not even like a thing, chase the market up, right? We just price whatever you want, you're gonna get it, no doubt. Chasing the market down, I can tell you when I would walk into listing appointments um, back in 2008, 2009, 2010, I went from being the guy, like when I walked in the door, they were like, hey, I'm like, hey, we're, we're gonna price it, we're getting 20 offers. We're like, hey, let's get the champagne. What do you think you guys want for this house? And we would just put the price up and then boom, right? Like, that, cool, we get like 20 offers, whatever it is. When I walked into listing appointments in 2009, 2010, 
2011, I walked in like I was the reaper, right? And like, they would look at me and they would be like, oh God, what are you going to tell us? And so that was the, it was a complete shift of the mind. However, pricing at the market, when the market is appreciating, is a lot easier than when the market's going down. Because if you price at the market when the market's going down, if you miss that price, and this, this is what I liken myself to being very good at pricing properties because of how I had to experience that back then. I feel like I've, I've built who I am today based on all that stuff that happened then. If you price the house to the market in a declining market, you're gonna cost your seller a lot of money, without a doubt. When you price it according to market in an appreciating market, you're in good shape because the market's gonna catch up. Even if it's a little high, the market's gonna catch up, but you ultimately wanna price the house right where it's supposed to be. In a declining market, depending on how fast that market is declining, if you price it where it's supposed to be, you're gonna cost your seller a lot of money. So just keep that in mind. Um, again, we are in such an appreciating market right now. I don't think we have this conversation for a while, but I do think this conversation comes back uh, in terms of price correction and, and all this other stuff. It, it, it has to, it has to, because I remember last time it's like, you know, what goes up is never coming down. And that is absolutely not the case. Um, and so, which leads us to our next point here, number six, don't be- so Sean, Sean, just a real quick question. If yeah. you're pricing, what are you suggesting in a down in a declining market? You're saying that you should be pricing it below where it should trade. You should be pricing it below in a declining market. Yeah. Okay. Because at the end of the day, if it's priced right, the market's going to drive it up regardless because it's based off of market value. It's based on what a buyer is willing to pay for it. So in a declining market, the 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 negative of being at market outweighs the positive of being lower to where it can still get bid up. Because don't forget, in a declining market, there are still bidding wars. 100% still bidding wars in declining market, if it's priced right. So um, is there like a certain percentage plus minus? Not really. You have to go with your knowledge and what you really, uh, what you really believe the house is worth. And then just a little tidbit, like for me, before I walk into a house, I have a price in my head. And so when I go on a CMA or a listing appointment or go take a listing, whatever you want to call it, whatever you call it in your world, I would advise you call it taking a listing, like Ronnie pointed out in his last session. Um, you have to go in there knowing what the price is going to be. And you walking through that house, you're either going to validate it or you're going to, you're going to devaluate it, right? Whatever the, whatever the, whatever the converse of you know, uh, uh, whatever the converse is there. So um, validation, when I walk through a listing, right? Like if I'm walking through it, I'm like, all right, you know, this, this molding's hanging off here. I got a water stain here. Every time I see something that's going down and down and down, if I walk through, I'm like, all right, cool. This is pretty much exactly how I envisioned it. My price is, is gonna be the price. Um, and that's why I bring all this stuff with me because me, I'm the kind of guy like, I don't want a two-step listing process. If I have an opportunity to get a listing agreement signed right now, I'm getting it signed, right? Because I walk out that door, they might run into some guy called a salesman. I don't have another shot to get in. So that's why I go with everything. I'm still, and I'll show you this, I'm still heavy. I'm still heavy in paper, right? Like some guys just bring a laptop or just bring whatever. I don't know who's going to be on the other side, right? Like if I go in there and I know I'm, I'm dealing with somebody that's, that's my age, my generation, whatever, I could, I could do the whole thing on a computer. I'm totally cool. If I go in there and I have, you know, a 65, 75 year old uh, widow or somebody on the other end and I'm flying around on the computer, it, they usually have a hard time following. So I bring my, my listing packet. It's still, still hard cover, right? And the comps, I'll print the comps which we'll go over very shortly, but I will print the comps. The comps will sit in here as a one page MLS report um, that, let's see if I have, let's see, no, I don't have any MLS stuff here, uh, but it would just be the, the, the agent full report from the MLS. And I would have all those comps there and I would have my comps saved in the MLS. And so what I do, because paper is very two dimensional, I can't like click on the top of the picture and, and show them all the pictures. 
I'll have all my paper laid out and I'll, I'll make the determination while I'm at the table. Like, do I go through the paper and show them on the computer or do I just show them on the computer? Typically what I do is I say, hey, I brought my computer so I could show you the back end of what we look at. And I show them the paper and on the paper I say, hey, I can't click this picture and show you that there are other pictures in here. And even though this says eight days on market, you know, I can't show you that this house has been on the market six months prior with another agent. And before that it was on with three other agents for 200 grand more, but what you see is six days on the market. I can't show them that if I don't bring my laptop. So that's why I bring that. And again, and I, like I tell, hey, full transparency, I'm showing you what we use, I'm showing you the system that we use, our back end, the MLS, the full history on each one of these listings. And I'll be honest with you, I, I walk out of a listing appointment, I'm gonna say 80% of the time of the listing. So, um, so again, what can you do or how can you differentiate yourself at that table? Because I know most of the people are not going to do that and take that time to go through each and every single one of those things. Um, so to get back here, uh, don't be afraid to be professionally honest. Pricing it right is hard work, but it's worth it because it gets your sellers to their goals and, and you make money for your business. Professional honesty is your best approach. It means understanding where the customers are coming from and being professional enough to stand up for them and tell them the truth about tough topics such as market conditions, property condition, features, amenities, location, buyer and buyer agent feedback, comparable property sales. So um, a, one, of my, one of my mentors once told me uh, your success outside of real estate, just in general, your success in life um, will be tied to the amount of uncomfortable conversations that you have along the way. And, and it's so true, sitting at a table with a seller, and again, because we're in a very, very quickly appreciating market, the conversations are generally good. And you generally don't have to, you generally don't have to be the bad guy, right? And so it's easy to have the conversations now, but the conversations about price, being brutally honest about price, those are the conversations that are going to make you the hero later on when somebody else walks in there and tells people whatever they want to hear. And it's, 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 a, it's an uncomfortable conversation when you have to be real with these people. So, and people on the other end appreciate that. I go in there and I'm like, okay, how is this person testing me for me to be honest? Right? Like, what is this person testing from their lives to push me to see how truthful I'm going to be with them? And so that's why, again, transparency, integrity, like that is, those are all things at my core that, you know, it's not always all rainbows, right? Like to agree with the seller on everything because of, you know, the, the house was built with the golden nails and they have the, you know, the golden toilet and all this other stuff. Like, that's awesome. That served you well but that's not gonna get you more money for this house right now. And to say that to a seller is more valuable than to not say that to a seller, price it whatever they want and have the thing never sell. So, um, so just be honest, really, you know, and uh, so let's see, so they actually have, so they have a short script here to addressing price honestly. Uh, so agent, do you want me to tell you the truth or do you want me to tell you what you want to hear? I don't know if I'd ever say that, but do you ever, do you, do you want me to tell you the truth? Or do you want me to tell you what you want to hear? If a seller insists on a higher than market price and get an agreement now, if you do not have a bona fide offer in a reasonable or short period of time to reduce the price to your recommended price. So off the script here for a second, I can tell you back in the day, I hate going back in the day, man, but because we're in such a different time period now where you know, you could, you could set the price and the market's going to hit it for the most part, as long as you are, if you're within range, right. But I would go into listing, uh, listing appointments. And I would also, I would have a change form with me in my listing packet and in my, on my, on my change form, um, we would have, you know, uh, price reduction checked. Um, and that would be in the back. And if somebody wanted to list something, I don't have that in here now, and I probably should add it to my listing packet. But if somebody wanted to list something and I wasn't in agreement with it, I would do my best. And ultimately at the end, at the end of the day, it's not my house. I'm not the one that's making that XYZ thousand dollar mortgage payment 
um, every single month, right? And so I'm not the one that's that, that's moving. However, it is my job. I am compelled to teach the truth, to educate the truth, and to give the best of me and my knowledge to the person on the other side of that table who's going to pay me a lot of money for my expertise and for what I do to get them from point A to point B. And so what I would do, if I could not convince them at the end of the listing appointment, but I knew that their motivations were that they had to sell this house, I wasn't about to leave without having a signed listing because a signed listing realistically is, 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 is a near guaranteed payday. Um, when I say near, you should get paid from a listing, no doubt about it, right? So listings, maybe 75, 80% fallout, if that, but it's a near guaranteed payday. You are very likely to get paid for your efforts with a listing. And so what I would do is if I'm like, hey, look, all right, I'm not leaving here without a signed listing. I would make the agreement, we'll try your price for two weeks or three weeks. However, I have an agreement here that says if the house is not sold by this price, we're going to reduce it to this price. And I'm going to agree to your price. You're going to get 100% of me, 100% of my marketing, 100% of my advertising, 100% of what I do to sell houses no matter what. So I want 100% of your commitment as well. So we're going to commit to your price. We're going to do what we have to do. We're going to full steam ahead and we're going to, hopefully we get it. The more money I get you, the more money I make, the more we're all happy. If it doesn't sell, um, if, if we can't come to an agreement, we're going to, we're going to sign this here. We're going to go over this and I'm going to go over the agreement and within three weeks or four weeks or two weeks, whatever, whatever the fill in the blank date is, we're going to reduce it to this price. And I'm going to tell you nine times out of 10, it works. It works. And that's what this pretty much does here. And I'll run through this script for you guys too. Um, do you want me to tell you the truth or do you want me to tell you what you want to hear? You're going to say, you know, I want you to tell me the truth. I'm going to say, so for the first few weeks, your home's on the market. It's the most crucial and will attract the most serious buyers. If we don't get a bona fide offer in this time, the market is telling us the home is overpriced. If after three weeks, this is what's happening, do you agree to reduce the price to my recommended price to meet the market demands? And then let them answer. I would switch around the words, make it my own. I, I, I 1 million percent think you need to adopt this and make it your own, practice this, because this is gonna be a, a, a script that's gonna be needed down the road. Even now, again, because every house doesn't sell with a million offers on it. The ones that, that don't, you need to be prepared and this conversation, through my experience, is best had after you go through all your marketing and everything that you do, right? Because again, when the house doesn't sell, who do they want to blame? They want to blame the agent. However, if you show your value and that you're doing your job and you're doing this and you're doing this and you're doing this and you're doing this, you're doing this, you're, doing this, you're allowing the access, right? One of the things that we can control, what's left to change? Mm. That would be the price. Um, so we got that. That's a great script. Um, so let's see. All right. So this is where being in a class is super helpful because this would be your guys' turn with pricing strategies. Um, you guys would break into groups. You would uh, you would you would just participate in you know some some discussion here when you guys would be a seller you do like some seller talk um just talk about some factors that drive price so why don't we um why don't we all why don't we all unmute ourselves here and why don't we just kind of shout out here uh an answer to some of these questions so um so we're gonna put the essence of critical thinking uh critical pricing strategies below in our own words so let's not take any longer than than five minutes here um and really work to to get some of this stuff out. I, I would I, like I really want to hear from some of you guys. Um, as much as I love hearing myself talk, I would love to hear you know what you guys are learning here. So give me a couple factors that that drive price. Location. Recent sales. Recent sales. Location. Location's huge. Recent sales. Um, um, future value. Explain. Like. If you know there's gonna be a train station coming into town within the next couple of years, or if you're gonna build like a shopping mall, like some place that's walkable, you know, things along those lines, or like maybe a, like like a line to the city, a bus line, or okay. or another condo complex a quarter mile down the road. 
Is, right. that, that's a bad thing, though, right? <laughs> Correct. Correct. But no, it drives the not. price. But, but it's definitely a factor. It's a driver. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. Condition. Cool. Absolutely. Um, the accessible rate on taxes would that be a factor? Like, if it's a higher tax rate, would that possibly drive down the value of the property? Is that uh, is that an assumption, or is that just me? It would drive down market value. It could. It could drive down. I wouldn't say it would. It could. It could okay. drive down market value. Yep. Amenities. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if this counts as amenities, but walkability to to I guess local areas like shopping, bars, restaurants, schools, right? right? Mm -hmm. Um, how how well the school ranks, I guess, in the state. School system, system. absolutely. Right. I, I was gonna say interest rates as well. Interest rates, yep, absolutely. There's some external factors. Yeah. What sells? What sells a house? Bathrooms. <laughs> um, Size. Kitchen. How, how functional it is. We're missing one word with a P. Oh. Price. <laughs> Price. 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 Oh. A good one. Oh, definitely a good one. <laughs> a good one. Definitely a great one. Especially if you've priced one recently. Mm -hmm. Those are nuts, man. <laughs> um, cool. So what can the seller can and cannot control? This accessibility. Price and condition. Price and condition can control. What can we not control? What can the seller not control? The market. Market. Yeah. Location. Right. Location. Any external factor really, they really can't control, I don't think. Right, right. Comps that are yeah. coming on the market after. Natural disaster, right? Comps is a great one. Can't control the comps. That is, that's huge discussing that with the seller as well, because that is ultimately what is going to change the market are the comps, right? So now let's say the market, the market's here, you have this house here, you have to sell it. Now, all of a sudden you're on the market two weeks, three weeks, the price hasn't adjusted yet. And now this guy's like, I just got relocated to Florida. I got to sell quickly. And now, boom, that becomes the comp. And then the next guy comes on, and then, boom, that becomes the comp. This person that's here that didn't adjust now has to come down here. That's what I was saying. If you don't price it right, especially in a declining market, if, you don't, if, if you're pricing it in the market, in a declining market, that's ultimately how it'll cost your seller a lot more money. And when a house sells for 20 grand less than the next house, that's, it's just like the next, you know, just like how we're in now, the trickle up effect, one house sells for 20 grand more, the next neighbor comes out for 20 grand uh, at that number, that sells for 20 grand more, then the neighbor comes on, that sells for 20 grand more. The same thing works in reverse too, right? Like this comp is here, sells for 20 grand less, this guy comes on, this guy tries to say, well, the market's still great, maybe I get another buy, you know, I, I have the golden nails and the golden toilet in my house. Um, and now this house doesn't sell. This house comes out for 20 grand less. Hello. This house comes out for 20 grand less. Next thing you know, this guy with the golden nails, the golden toilet, he's like, shoot, I can't sell my house. Now I got to sell for hundred grand less. So um, again, it's, 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 and Mike, you probably know this more than anybody. Like this is, it's a, it's a market, right? It's, it's just, cause you're in the finance world, right? It's a stock market. It's, it's, it's any kind of market. The difference here is you actually live in this val in this in this asset that that value fluctuates, so um, cool. All right, and so what is what's the window of opportunity here? The first few weeks. First few weeks. And then just kind of goes down. Yeah. Point on. Yep. So actually, I actually have a question about that. Um, yeah. For your own personal experience, do you ever have expire listings? And if so. How does that work? And how does that conversation work? And how does the, and then do you like relist with the same sellers? Or do you kind of move on? How, how does all that kind of unfold? I don't think, I don't think yeah. really that. List, listings still expire um, no matter what, right? We're in a, we're in a market. If they, uh, if they, if they don't listen, if they don't listen up front or, you know, look, you can, you can, you can only do so much in model as possible, right? We always want to be as good, perfect realtors as we could possibly be. Sometimes it just doesn't work out and that's okay. Um, it's not okay, but it is okay. You put time, energy, effort into it. And if it doesn't work out, 
yeah, you want to you want to try to relist it, right? And like a lot of the a lot of the time, at least like if if I have a listing that expires, which is which is very rare, especially in this market for anybody, pretty much. But you want to you want to rebrand it, right? You want to recreate the strategy. If you go back and you start doing and saying the things that um, when you first got the listing that didn't work, and you go back and say that again, you're 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 in a position where you're going to be in the same exact position six months down the road or three months down the road if they relist it with you. Um, but yeah, listings expire all the time. There's no question about it. They are expiring less and less because the way the market is. But yeah, I mean, look, there's. There's story after story where I list the property, it expires. Some other realtor lists it a week later and it sells over asking price. That's just, that's the way it is. And, and look, I can either beat myself up about it or I can say, okay, Sean, smack myself in the back of the head or the back and pull myself up by the shirt and move on and go get another one, right? So it's, it's all about, um, it's all about the energy. It's all about the time. It's all about, you know, how much do you want to spend on it? But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you don't want a listing to expire. If a listing does expire, or if you are coming close to the expiration, um, you need to have that conversation, and it needs to be it needs to be a real, again, um, tough conversation. So, and most likely it's price. Most likely it's price. Everything sells for the right price. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Sean, uh, um, how do you approach? Uh, the uh, different classes of, uh, of of pricing, as far as um, a home that's worth like you know five hundred versus a multi million dollar home, how does the conversation change? Uh, with because I, from I'm having a lot of conversations, I'm making tons of calls, uh, prospecting, and I, I notice a big difference in someone who's selling a four hundred five hundred thousand dollar home versus someone who's, you know, got 1.5, 2 million or, or more. Um, the conversation feels different, you know, when I'm talking to both of those uh, potential sellers. So a lot of it depends on, you know, the person's personality. And, you know, the, the person that's selling a $1.5 million house, they're, they're probably a little bit more savvy. They probably think they're a little bit more savvy. Um, you know, there's a reason why they're selling a house that's 1.5 million bucks. Um, you know, you, you have to be a chameleon in this business, right? You like, you have to be able to speak multiple languages. And, and when I say multiple languages, I don't, I don't mean in a sense of, um, you know, national languages, right. Or any kind of nationality or anything like that. You need to be able to talk to people on a level that relates to where they are. Um, and so like, I have a guy coming here at four o'clock in the morning, I'm putting his house in the market for 1.5 million bucks in Wayne. And he had it listed with somebody else it expired. They couldn't sell it. Um, you got to talk their language, right? You got to talk the language of the person on the other end of the phone. And so you have to do it with a sense of authenticity because no matter what, you know, whether you're in a, whether you're in a, you know, whether you're in a, a $1,200 a month rental or, you know, $1.5 million house, people sense fake from a million miles away. And so if you're authentic and you're genuine and you actually believe in your service and your core that you're the best, like for me, when I talk to people, I know that I'm the best option, right? Whether I'm the number one realtor, whether I'm the number whatever realtor, whatever, I know deep down inside of my gut, I am the best option for these people. So I come across as the best option, right? And so if somebody's talking to me and says, I got to sell my $200,000 condo, I'm your best option. If somebody says, I got to sell my $1.5 million new construction, I'm your best option, right? And so I just need to change my flow to match theirs, my energy to match theirs. Make sense? Definitely. The main differences uh, that I personally see yeah. is, is the level of patience uh, that someone selling uh, a four or $500,000 home has in comparison to 1.5. Uh, four to 500, they got time, they wanna talk, they wanna listen to you. Uh, 1.5, th they're not interested in, in small talk. They want you to get right to the point. They want facts. They want, you know, they don't want, you know, no sugar coating. They, you know, you need to be on point. And, you know, for me, um, I'm learning a lot. I, I'm a constant learner. I love to learn. I don't believe that I will ever stop learning even to the day that I die. I'm never too shy to learn from someone half my age or a third of my age or whatever. I don't care. As long as a lesson is being learned and I'm improving who I am as a person and as a professional. 
Uh, I was uh, an incredible professional in my previous uh, career. Uh, you know, I was a wine and beverage director of a Michelin star restaurant. I was selling five, six, ten thousand dollar bottles of wine. I knew everything about wine and that world. This world is a little bit different to me, uh, but in a sense, it's still, uh, you know, you're still a salesperson. Ten thousand dollar bottle of wine. You know, yeah. look, if you're you're selling a one point five million dollar house, chances are you've you've either bought, paid for. Uh, you know, a glass of or drank some some somewhere along is a, a ten thousand dollar bottle of wine, um, somewhere along the lines, and so look, man, I'm 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 a I'm I'm of shock value, right? And so if you're talking to somebody and they're super to the point, break the pattern, right? Like if they're talking to them, like, what do you do? What do you do? I'm like, can I ask you a question? What kind of wine you drink? <laughs> what are we talking about? All right, boom! You just differentiated yourself from every other realtor on the planet. And there's a good chance a person sold a $1.5 million house probably oh, knows a little bit of knowledge about some wine. Mm -hmm. Break the pattern, dude. Break it. That's it, right? Like, know you're the best. Know that you know what you're talking about. If you don't know what the heck you're talking about, I don't want to say pretend that you know what you're talking about, but create some kind of shock value that's going to bring this person or that person or whatever person to your level if you can't match that level, right? So mm -hmm. that's just my... It's just from, it's like a little Dale Carnegie kind of, you know, Tony Robbins stuff back in there. So um, break the pattern, you know, if, if it's just too, what's your, what's your commission? And look, you don't know who the person is on the other line. It's a shot in the dark. The way I would approach it is, hey, I already don't have this listing. What's the worst that happens? I don't have it after this phone call. Boom, just break the pattern, shock and be like, let me ask you a question. What kind of wine do you drink? And he's going to ask you, he's going to say, well, what does that have to do with anything? You just took him out of his comfort zone, right? And now you have the conversation, you have the floor, bring him where you want. Who knows? Maybe like, because I just want to buy you a bottle of wine. Right? Who knows? So just my uh, two cents there. Um, all right. So let's jump back into, uh, let's jump back into this here. I got a $1.5 billion dollar seller coming in in, uh, in an hour and a half. I got to be mentally prepared. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. So you got to evaluate one another's presentation and make suggestions. Okay, guys, so we're past that. So the CMA, this is where it is at. Um, let me see. So where are we here? Give me one sec. I just want to see where we are. Okay. All right. Because I, I need to know how much time I'm going to be able to, uh, to spend on this part. So I'm on 20... So I'm on 20 of 37. Jeez, I'm like halfway there. All right, guys, we're going to go through this and I'm going to show you the, the rock star way to do this. Um, all right, cool. So CMA, comparative market analysis. CMA is a process by which a property, uh, by which a property to be listed is evaluated against other comparable properties to determine a recommended list price. Use the CMA to present information to help sellers understand and accept the right price for their home. CMA process includes the following. Search. So you go search MLS, search for properties uh, that correspond to the subject property. Um, subject property obviously is the one that you're pricing. Uh, use the four main criteria, location, size, amenities, condition. Uh, and then you're also going to select a small number of recently sold properties and properties pending. Um, and then so this says here, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to DJ this here for a second. So this, this is decide uh, if you want to use um, active listings. So the way that I go about my listing presentations, I put a huge emphasis, especially in this market, because it's such a very low supply. And this is going to help you now, right? And so when you look at solds, I know, remember I was telling you, like, I'm going to give you my view on solds um, later. This was before. My view on solds is when you're looking at a sold property, you're looking in the rear view mirror, right? So if I go back six months to solds, what are we? We're, I don't even know, what, what, what month are we in? March? So you figure February, January, December, uh, November, October, September. So I'm going back to September right now. Not only am I going back to September, I'm going back to a property that was most likely under contract. I'm going to use a general ballpark figure for two months. 
So that brings me August, July. And I'm going to say that that property was on the market at least for two weeks, potentially one month. So I'm going to use one month as the average market, uh, average days on market is about 30 days. That brings me back to June. So I'm going to a seller saying, I'm going to use June to let you know what your house is worth in March. Yeah, makes no sense. We're on a different planet than we were in June. So that's why I don't place as much emphasis on sold right now in this current market than I typically do. And when I go back on my solds, and I'll show you, um, let's see. Oh, I didn't, I'm actually, I didn't know I was screen recording this whole time. You guys didn't tell me. Sorry about that. I thought I was sitting here posing for the camera all this time. <clears throat> all right, cool. So if I go back to the MLS, let's say, let's say I want to run a search on a property in Wayne. So I'm going to pull 2514. Guys, one thing I can tell you is like super important for me, um, know your town codes. So when you're looking at your town codes, uh, or when you're looking at your towns, you go into your county, right? Like we know say County is 2-5, uh, Essex County is 1-6. Morris County is two, three. It just makes things so much faster um, when you're doing your searches. Just know your town codes. Like I know town, you know, again, just doing this for a long time. I know Wayne is two, five, one, four. You know, um, look at our Kenelon, two, three, one, five. Um, you know, so let's say, we're, let's say we're pulling Wayne. This just makes you, again, if you're pulling your listing, uh, your laptop with you and your listing appointments, this just makes you speed through this stuff much faster. And it makes you know, or make it shows the person on the other end of that table um, that you know exactly what you're doing um, and you're able to work your systems. So let's say I'm, I'm going to a property, um, you guys are property 59 Lake Drive East uh, in Packinac Lake. So um, I know that that property is on the market. I'm gonna use that property as an example. I showed it yesterday. That was the one I, it was very difficult to get into um, that we, uh, that we eventually, you know, there were four other offers. We couldn't get into it. So long story short. So I'm going to use 59 Lake Drive East as a comparison uh, or as my subject rather. So then I would go into here. I would check all these. So you've got active, under contract, sold. And then when I go into solds, uh, closing date, one, two, three. <sighs> Again, some people go back six months. Appraisers go back six months. Um, for this demonstration purposes, I honestly, like, I don't like going back more than three or four months. So but I'll go one, two, three, four. And then I typically just bring it back to the first of that month. So I go back to November 1st. Um, and let's say I just pull up Wayne, there's 450 records, right? And so I'm going to imagine this is a completely crazy area that I know absolutely nothing about. Um, and so we have all these properties here. You're like, oh my God, how do I narrow it down? You know, you can go by, let's say we, uh, let's say we, we know the property is a four bedroom home. Uh, so I'm going to go three, I'm going to go one over. I'm going to put five, five is a little overwhelming. I leave the four right in the middle. I want a little under, I'm going to a little over. I do the same thing with pricing. Let's say I have a general ballpark for what this price is, which I typically do. I would put my general ballpark in, but if you're if you're very new at doing this and you want to paint the entire picture, I wouldn't. I me personally, I wouldn't even put bedrooms in because I want to see. Mm, no bedrooms. Yeah. So in, in my head, I break this down in a macro level and a micro level. On the macro level, I wouldn't put any bedrooms in, right? Like I I want to know the overall. And so this might even be something I would look at even before I go to this property. Again, being that I know nothing about this area, I hit search. So let's use these four. We don't see your screen, Sean. You don't see my screen. Hang on one sec. Hey, Sean, while you're trying to bring that up, what would you think about using um, the total tax amount? Let's say the taxes were 10000 and then going a little bit over and a little bit below that taxes on that subject property to at least bring you into the same ballpark. Um, I, I, I don't I, I don't want to use taxes, to be honest with you. Okay. I don't. Um, so when I wanna when I wanna bring it into somewhat of a ballpark, 
I'm going to know what that ballpark is. So I'm going to use the exact price. I'm going to use the price for the ballpark. For taxes, there's some things that could skew it, right? Like what if somebody put an addition on their house and they didn't get permits? What if, you know, what if there's a veteran or, uh, you know, a senior and their taxes are frozen? There's so many, so many variables to using taxes. I just, I, I think there's a better way. Okay. Um, so, so let's say just for example's sake, I'm going to use all 450 of these properties. I'm going to click here. Let's say I know nothing about this neighborhood. I know nothing about where I'm going. This guy called me, you know, he wants me to list this house and, you know, I don't even know how the heck I got it. So this is the easiest, simplest way to narrow down uh, where you're going and to get a very good general idea. So I say, let's say I'm going to 59 Lake Drive East, Wayne, okay. So this is where some skill comes into. You don't have to, you don't have to be a you have to be an eagle scout to figure out maps, but you got to have some kind of direction, right? So like I'm looking at this map now. I typically bring this into here. Do you see the Google map here on my my screen? Cool. All right. And so now I'm looking here at this map. This is the MLS map. So now I'm going to zoom in. And I'm gonna I'm gonna get a you get a general sense of where I am, right? I'm like, okay, here's my subject property. Here's a property I'm trying to figure out how to place this value on. So I know it's somewhere. I'm like, all right, cool. What am I looking for? I'm looking for some landmarks here. I see some water. I'm like, no, that's not it. I see a little water here. I'm like, oh, that looks like it. Cool. Let me let me zoom in a little bit. Ah, Packinac Lake. I know I'm going to Packinac Lake. Ah, here's Packinac Lake. Cool. Great. This is, this is me talking out loud in my head. Usually I don't say this as I'm doing this, right? So now I know where I have a general idea of where I am. So now I'm going to take this tool and I'm going to get, let's say I get a little bit of a, more of a macro look here, right? I'm going to take this. I don't do radius. I don't do quarter mile, half mile. I look at it and I gauge where do I think I should go out of? Where do I think I should go into? Um, I don't know if it comes with time. I don't know if it's a, again, I don't know if it's like a spidey sense or whatever, but you just have to get an idea of where you're going, right? Like I know there's a pretty immediate market here. Um, and so now, no matter what, I just excluded everything that's over there. So what I could do here, I go to narrow on my comps. Now those hundred and whatever properties are now narrowed down to whatever is in my map. Remember, we didn't put a price in here either. There's no price. Um, so now, cool, let me see, where else am I going? Oh, it's on this side of the lake. All right, how do I, how do I get a little closer? Now I start zooming in. Now I'm like, all right, so let's figure out if this is right here, what other data do I have that can bring me closer here? Okay, so this is the whole lake here. All right, so I got some stuff going on over here. And in all transparency, guys, I know Packinac Lake very well. I know it like the back of my hand. Um, I know that you got the east side of the lake. I know that you got the west side of the lake. However, if I'm looking at this as, as a completely blind person, I know that this looks like it's pretty outside of the lake. All this stuff seems a little closer. So now I wanna squeeze into these closer ones, okay? And now I'm gonna hit narrow again. And now I'm just left with these, okay? So now I got some stuff to look at. I'm like, okay, cool. I don't need to, I don't need to play Cub Scout anymore. I'm gonna drop the map. Now I have, I have 30, uh, I have 30, 34 properties here. And so let's see, I got one, two, three, four actives. Of those four actives, one, two, three are in turn review. So the picture that I really have to paint is there's one house for sale in the whole lake. So that's pretty crazy, right? And so now I look at how many under contracts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I have 10 under contracts, three that are about to go under contracts. So I have 13 under contracts and one active. What kind of market does that look like it is? Somebody say sellers. All right, sellers. huge seller's market, huge seller's market. And so this is a huge reason why I don't 
put so much emphasis on the solds, right? And you do because you need to you need to you need to know somewhat of pricing. However, the market of the moment, where the market is right now, there are not enough houses in Packinac Lake to go on the market to facilitate the buyer demand. Like for every, for call it for every every one house on the market, 17 go under contract. <laughs> so if you want to explain how much demand there is within the lake or, or within uh, around Packinac Lake, it's a pretty good talking point without a doubt, right? Like now I'm looking at this, can I send a mailer to Packinac Lake? Can I, can I have my ISA call around the lake to see if anybody's looking to sell? Can I create a script around, there is one house for sale around Packinac Lake while 17 others are under contract. Have you thought about selling? Because if so, now is the best time that you'll probably never see again, right? Like now you can actually start to create some narrative around what you see through the data that is very, 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 very real. Um, so what I do here typically, so now I have, I have this whole expanded uh, model of these properties here. And so what I'll typically do, I'll go to this button here, save results. I'm going to say 59, uh, 59 Lake Drive East. Um, comps. So that's what we do. So I do 59 Lake Drive East comps, and then I would say, you know, just just for here, just for these purposes, night sample CMA. So I don't confuse myself. And then so I'm going to go over here. I'm going to hit save. Cool. And so this is an expanded view for me. Now, if I know what kind of house I'm going into, I'm like, okay, you know, how many. Now I can get rid of this. I don't have to keep all these all checked. Now, by process of elimination, what am I? What do I know that I'm not walking into? Right? Like I know I'm not walking into a million dollar house. So are there anything? You know, are there any houses that are like a million that are super high out there? Up there? No. I know I'm not walking into a log cabin. So I know I'm not walking into a three hundred thousand dollar house. So I would get rid of that. And now I would start by process of elimination, knowing what I'm not walking into and knowing what I am walking into. Now I can start to to you know, I can start to zoom in a little bit and and focus on my micro, right? Because you guys watch Gary V. I love Gary V. He always talks about macro and micro. Same thing in real estate as well. You want to look at the macro. You want to know what's going on in the town. That's why I ran everything in the town. We knew that there were you know 450 uh, comps total. We narrowed 450 down to 34. Okay, and so now I have this saved. I got 59 Lake Drive East comps. Ignite sample CMA. Oops, um, I hit this button by mistake. Another huge game changer for me. If you click this button that says session right here, you now have a second session in the MLS. I don't know if you guys know that. So now I could toggle back and forth between these sessions. And this is, I'll be honest with you, this is what makes me so damn powerful at a listing table because I could, I could fly around the MLS like you wouldn't believe. So I know that that's a superpower of mine, and that is why I bring my laptop with me. Because I know whether good, bad, or indifferent, I'm going to sit there and a the seller's going to look at this and be like, what the hell are you even doing? And I'm going to show them exactly what I do and how I arrive to it. Um, and they're going to be like, nobody's ever shown me this before in my life. And, and again, use what works for you. Use your superpower. Mine happens to be, I'm, I'm very good in the MLS. I can fly around these things and, and run circles around people's heads. And they're like, we don't even follow, but we agree. So, um, so now I got a second session open. So now what I'm going to do, and I'm going to say, Hey, look, you know, now that I know where I'm at, let's break this down a little bit more. Okay. So we're going to do actives coming soon. So I'm going to go back to my town code 2514. I'm going to go to my status, just active and under contract. I don't want the solds right now. So now I know I'm walking into a house that's going to be between five and 600,000 bucks. So I'm going to type my little thing in, you know, 502, I'm sorry, 602. I'm going to search. So there's currently 38 actives and under contracts. Okay. So now I know we have 13 actives, one coming soon, a bunch of these in attorney review. So how many do we have under contract? 14 to 38. We have 24. 24 plus one, two, three, four that are in attorney review. So realistically, we have 28 that are under contract. Um, the MLS did this thing where wherever you click, you click on the 
like that if I click here, it's going to click that that checkbox. I don't like it because I'm a clicker. I always click all over the screen. Um, and so now we know that we have all these properties. Okay. And so now we're in a price range where we could, let's say we go back to our map, um, map here. So now I know we want to be around Packernack Lake. We know Packernack Lake is right here. So if I'm in an area that I know absolutely nothing about, and I just want to see just the actives in that price range or just the actives in the other contracts, now I can narrow that again. So now my talking point becomes there is one house on the market, 300 contract right around the lake, right? I know this one is 599. I know that I would get to that. This is the one that I was using as my subject. Now I can toggle back and forth between these two, right? So now I have the macro, the, the, the smaller macro, right? Like I've zoomed into just somewhat of the lake. And then now I zoomed in to just somewhat of the lake with the price that I think we're going to be at. What I didn't add in here are solds. So then I'm going to go to my session. I click session again. Now I got one, two, three sessions on the MLS. Ask your clients if any of realtors ever showed them that. Now I'm going to uncheck everything. I'm just going to go to solds. I'm going to go back in. Right. And let's say, let's go use our pricing again, actually here. So we're going to put a closing date. So let's say we want to go back five months this time. One, two, three, four, five. I'm going to click on the first of the month. Um, and so let's say we want to use that same list price. We're going to go, oops, 498 to 602. Again, for anybody that wasn't on before, 498 is really 500. You, you want to capture the 499 stuff. Uh, 602 is really 600. You want to capture the, you know, any realtor that tries to be cute to do like a 601 or whatever they do. Um, and then we'll search this again. The map tool is definitely your friend. I could do this in Packnack Lake without the map tool. I'm pretending I don't know anything about where I'm going. Um, and so now, Again, I'll, I'll use this west side a little bit. We'll narrow that down. And so now you have these 10 solds that sold within the last uh, five months. You have your actives and your under contracts and you have it all, okay? And so this is good because this is saved here. Uh, so you have your 59 Lake Drive East saved. And so no matter what, you can always go back to this. There's a couple things I usually do with these. These I usually pull up while I'm there with the person because I like to look at the macro before I go. I like to look at the micro. When I look at the macro, I know what I'm looking for within the micro. And this stuff is basically what I look for before I even get to the listing appointment, but I don't typically save these. I'll pull these up when I'm with the consumer, with the seller. Um, but you could save these as well. There's also this thing called the cart. Cart is awesome. So I don't want to start another session because I'll probably log myself out. I think you're limited to four sessions somewhere, but use this stuff to your advantage, man. Like it's, it's here to make our lives easier. It's here to make you better. So use it. Um, carts are great. You can, uh, you can create a new cart, like add to another cart. Uh, my carts are full. I think you're only allowed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's see, let's see if I add a new cart. Okay, so sample, sample for so sample for ignite. So now I have this cart. So now I go to sample for ignite. So now I have all the actives here. I can always go back to this within my cart. And what I could do here, go to these solds. I could take this. I can go and add this to, you guessed it, sample for Ignite, boom. And so now I go to my cart, I go to view cart, all those I have right here. So now I just took all these, which are 34, I narrowed it down to 14. So now I'm really honed in. Now this is my micro. Now I'm floating around with 
Now I'm floating around with getting an accurate value in this house based off of comparable properties. You guys follow? That is how you would determine the comps to use based on location. And there is a science to it. There's an art to it. And now when it comes to actually determining the value, you know, you're within 500 and 600,000 bucks. Now, when you're at the house, now you're looking at bedrooms. Okay. And then you can click on these little, I don't want to call them hyperlinks, whatever they are, they're, they're hot buttons. Um, right. So if I want to, if I want to, if I want to narrow this by bedroom, right, let's look at the three bedrooms. So here we have four or three bedrooms that sold. How do these compare? When you're at the listing table, you're like, how does this compare to, to where we are? Now you're looking through it. It's a beautiful house, really nice hardwood floors. You got the crown molding, granite countertops, stainless steel appliances. Does this, does this look like your kitchen? Let them answer. Like, what do you, what's, what's the difference between this kitchen and your kitchen? Well, we didn't touch our kitchen in the past 20 years. This looks like it's pretty new. Okay, cool. Check off the box for, we're taking some, we're taking some money off, right? And so ultimately it becomes a, 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 a game of give and take, okay? So like, this is a very nice house. This would score pretty high on the list. One thing we have to take into consideration is this house on the lake. This is on Beachwood Road. Now you're at Ratzer to Beachwood Road. This is not on the lake. Wait a minute, my backyard, I'm looking at a boat sitting, sitting on my dock. Ching, the value goes up, right? And so that's one in the count in the column for we're adding some money back in. So at that point, it's a give and take. And to, to actually come up with a determined value, that is going to be um, something that's going to, to really come down to process of elimination. And, you know, you can add, you can subtract, you could do, you know, a couple dollars here, a couple dollars there. If you want to try a price per square foot, like if I took this house, again, this is why price per square foot isn't, isn't the most accurate. Let's say this house is on Beachwood Drive, right? It's a beautiful house. Um, be done. Like it looks like, you know, this is this is a dynamite house. Okay. This was listed for 498, sold for 498. This thing probably sells for 530 today, uh, even though this closed in December, right? So, but the square footage here, if I'm talking to a seller, uh, let's go to our property square footage. What number? Beachwood 171. Oops. So let's go to our, go to our search. It was 171 Beachwood. So let's see what the square footage is here. You're in Wayne, not Totowa. Ah, got it. Thank you. So let's look at the, so this is 1400 square feet. Okay. And so now what I like to do, so I'll duplicate that. I'll go to a new search here. And I know our subject is 59 Oakwood. I mean, I'm sorry, not 59 Oakwood. I sold that house. <laughs> um, 59 Lake Drive East. Uh, and so we know that this is 1800 square feet. Okay. However, we know that this house is on the lake. So we look at this smaller house that sold for 500 that's not on a lake that's completely done versus, versus this house that is on a lake that needs a ton of work. The lake ultimately, I'm going to click it on here, guys. Sorry about that. The lake ultimately location wins, right? So the location is going to be worth more without a doubt, because you're not going to be able to build another house on a lake without being on a lake, right? So that's something that you can't change. So in terms of value by location, um, this is actually a great example, because if we were to look at anything else on the lake, Come on. Ah. So this is the only thing I don't like. Whenever you hit these hot link things, you never get back to the way the MLS um, 
has it by default until you actually go back and research it, but that's totally fine. So what I would do is I would try to see if there's any other houses on the lake. If there are not any other houses on the lake, I know that I have to kick this into some kind of spidey sense type of gear and say, well, how much does the lake actually add in terms of value? So now I look at this, this thing needs everything. You can't even see the lake because it's snow covered. But knowing that this house is on the lake, knowing that this needs a ton of work, there's a value to that. And so by being an expert, what is that value? Does the lake bring 20% more value? It typically does. Um, so then looking at it from that perspective, you can, you actually see the photographer here in the corner and that's hilarious. So if I'm on a listing appointment and I'm using this as a comp, I would point that out. It looks like the, it looks like the stuffed bird over here is yelling at the photographer in the corner. <laughs> um, so, but like things like that, like those are stuff I would point out on a listing appointment and it just shows that you're in tune to what is going on in here. Um, so in terms of a value, you know, I know again, being a, on top, Pakanak Lake or Pines Lake, there's a there's there's likely a 20% swing on there. So knowing that this house sold for 500, right? 500, we're gonna add, let's say 20% to being on the lake for location. We know that that's probably about a hundred thousand dollar swing. And what I can tell you is that knowing that this property that I went to go show yesterday um, is 599, I know that there's multiple offers on it. They have four offers as of yesterday. So this thing is gonna sell for even over 20%. So this is a 599 house. Without knowing what this price is, to me, this price would be 599. So this was priced on the money. And if you take, let's, I want to call it real estate theory again. If you take the $300,000 valuation and you look at Wayne's equalization ratio um, at 48.03. Yeah, why do, I, why do I keep missing it? I always point it out in a listing of uh, presentation. I just remembered it from before. Right. And um, oh, hang on one sec, guys. And so when you look at that valuation and it's 48 point whatever percent, round that up to 50, you're looking almost at a $600,000 valuation. So here, this one actually fits the bill as well. This house needs everything, like soup to nuts, everything completely redone. Like it was one of those houses where it's like, uh, okay, this, this just ain't gonna work. Um, however, somebody sees the value in it. Somebody knows that you are not going to build any more property on a lake, uh, at least in Wayne. So there's value there, right? And that typically has a 20% value. So you do have to know some stuff going into it. Um, and by knowing that that property is on a lake, that is super helpful going into it. And that's definitely one of the questions that you would ask. But in terms of pulling comps, right? Like even if the house wasn't on the lake um, and it was just in Wayne, that is, that is the system, right? Like if you want to use maps, um, bedroom, stuff like that, that that's going to get you to where, to where you have the ability to talk about these comps and will likely be able to educate your client on these comps. You have to have some kind of direction going into it. You have to, like you need to know the bedrooms, you need to know the bathrooms, you need to know that stuff. <clears throat> and you have to have, you have to, you have to, you have to have the market knowledge to be like, all right, well, this sold, this sold, this is selling. There is nothing on the market right now. Like there's nothing on the market on the lake right now. So anybody, if anybody wants to buy on Packinac Lake, they have one house to choose from. When you go back to supply and demand, I mean, that is, that is the best position to be in. There, there's, there's, there's literally, there's nothing else you could buy, right? So that person basically could, I hate to say, ask whatever they want because at the end of the day, it still has to appraise, but all solds go out the window at that point. So um, you guys have any questions on that stuff? Anybody? Somebody's got to have a question on that because there was definitely a lot packed into that last 20 minutes. I actually have a question. Um, I had, um, I sent out cards to all my neighbors, just, you know, introducing myself because I just moved into the area and I had a neighbor reach out to me just saying, I want to know what my house is currently valued at before a kitchen or after a kitchen. Mm -hmm. 
um, where, like, how, how does that play into it, especially in this market? Because it, does it even matter for some, like, does the price matter at that point for like kitchen and they're, talk, they're not ready to sell by any means. They're just asking the question. So it, it does. It definitely does. And one of the things I always tell people, Hey, look, if you're really looking to sell your house, you don't want to put a nickel into it unless you're getting a dime out of it. Right. Um, and so when you go to do a kitchen, a kitchen is expensive. So if you're going to do the kitchen, is there, if you're not looking to sell it within the next three years, do the kitchen to the way you are going to enjoy it. Because at that point, it's not really going to matter. Right. Right. And so um, what I tell people is do it. If you plan on selling your house, like if you're like, all right, I'm going to do this kitchen so I can sell my house or I'm going to do this kitchen so I can enjoy the kitchen and then sell my house. Then there's going to be, you know, like don't go as high quality cabinets. Um, there's going to be ways to save the money. But in terms of like a dollar amount for a kitchen, they're really, there's so much that goes into what it could be. The market could tank, right? And there could be a hundred houses on the market within a, within a half a mile radius in the next three years, five years, whenever you're going to sell them. Right. But I mean, realistically for somebody doing a kitchen, um, if they're looking to sell their house in this market, it will make a difference. Uh, what the dollar amount is, there really is no dollar amount. It all depends. It all depends. Okay. Their, yeah. I was just thinking about just giving them like, in like, or just a range at this point be like, I know you're not looking to sell, like this is roughly where your house falls. Um, but I didn't know if that was right to do. You can definitely give them a range hundred percent. Yeah. And you say, Hey, look on the lower end, uh, on the lower end of the range, no kitchen on the upper end of the range, your kitchen. And I'll tell you the one thing about a range. And I know we talk about, um, a range somewhere along the lines in our ignite book here. Here's the one thing with pricing recommendations. Um, when you give a range, the key is to keep that range tight because if you don't keep that range tight, if you're like, uh, you know, yeah, you're, you're probably somewhere between, you know, six and a quarter or 675. What did they hear their house is worth? 675. Right. So you're six and a quarter. But if you're like, yeah, you know, you're probably like six and a quarter, 635, somewhere around there. You you built that tight cushion where, where they heard 635 and you're like, all right, 635, 635, 625, not too, too far off. Um, so just uh, that is that is definitely, you know, that's definitely something to keep in, in inside your head, too. And then one of the other things we um, we didn't talk about um, when you go and actually pull the CMA uh, or when you pull those comps, what you could do is you can actually run the CMA as well. Um, there are a couple different reports here. Let me see if I get back to share my screen. Okay. Did you guys see my, uh, my, my thing here, my screen? So if we were to go, let's say, So I'm gonna to go to this cart here. So I'm gonna to go to sample for Ignite. So let's say I click all these and I wanna to go to view, which are these three buttons here. <clears throat> so I would uncheck that, I go to client CMA and I would view and now it gives me all this data, which is also good data. And I'll be honest with you, I don't really go over this stuff at the listing table. I do think it's important um, it's just something that I don't spend or stress a lot of time on or stress or spend a lot of time on. So this will actually show you, uh, like average list price within your, within your, you know, your, your filters, AKA whatever you decide to put in here for your list price or however you're filtering your CMA. Um, so like between, you know, the average price between 500 and 600 is 545. So that, that's, that's really no surprise. You know, the, the average list price of the under contracts between 500 and 600 is 563. And that's, that's, that's kind of right in line. Uh, because there is only one house on the market within the areas that we selected, the average list price between 500 and 600 is basically 600. Um, average days on the market, when you look at the under contracts, the average days in the market are 48. When you look at the solds, the average days on the market, 15. Right. Somebody's going to say, well, how come the average days in the market are 48 for all these ones that are under contract? 
Well, what did we just pass the last couple of months? Christmas, okay? So these were listed within the holidays. So there's always an answer to the questions, right? This is on for eight days. We know we have this, this has multiple offers. Um, and then like a lot of these too, like this sold over asking, that 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 sold over asking. And so um, for full price to answer my own question before, there's nothing. So when you go and talk to people on what's actually going on in the market, how this stuff works, uh, just always remember, say, hey, look, you know, we live in an attorney state where there's attorney review. So at least subtract three days from these and that gives you a little bit more of, a, of an accurate picture. So even 15 days in the market, realistically, average days on the market is probably 12. A property's in the market 12 days before it has an accepted offer on it, which is a very accurate statement. Um, and this is under, this is under, when you go to view print, this is under client CMA. You can send that to them as well. There's This one's also, um, uh, vertical report is also a good report. This is pretty cool. What vertical report does, it puts your subject first and then it compares everything else to it. Um, almost like, like an appraisal, which is cool. It's very easy to get super caught up in all this stuff and explaining every little difference. The key, when I talk to my sellers, when I'm looking at solds, the biggest things you want to look at, you want to look at original list price, 594. You want to look at last list price, 594. You want to look at sold price, 600. And you want to look at days on the market. Because those three, those three numbers have the biggest correlation than any other thing that you look at on this page. No matter how pretty the remarks are, the photos, the house, the whatever, the original list price, to the last list price, to the sales price, to the days on the market. I, I, I call it, I call it the triad, even though it's even though it's four here, because I never used to put the original list price in there. I'd always just use last list price. But the original list price, especially now, because the market is so crazy, where things are selling so high over asking price. Um, what a lot of realtors are doing, they're actually taking the list price and they're raising it up so that it will appraise. It doesn't look like there's like such a huge disparity. So some people are doing that. Some people like, you know, they're trying to get pretty, but the, uh, those numbers have the biggest correlation to anything else um, that you're going to look at on an, on an MLS uh, printout. So um, keep that in mind when you talk to your sellers, I'm trying to think if there's anything on here, I got another minute to go through this stuff. Uh, any ahas, any, uh, Anything you want to talk about? Anything you learned? Any any questions or anything that you have here? Is that a legitimate thing to do to change the list price to match the? It's, it's really not. No, it's definitely really not. Some people do it. I, I don't agree with it. Um, I'm seeing it less and less, to be honest with you. But I do see some people still doing it. Like if a house doesn't appraise you know, or, or if it's like such a huge disparity. No, it's, it's, I, I don't, I don't think it's good practice personally. To change the list price, you're supposed to get it signed off by the owner. Which if, if I go to an owner and I'm like, Hey, we got a better chance of this house appraising. If we raise the price to what we actually sold it to, they're going to sign it. Yeah. It's all how you present it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it's yeah. on the presentation. Guys, any ahas? Anything? Um, did you guys learn some stuff today? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, absolutely, Sean. I've never used the mapping before. I think that's a great idea. It is super valuable. When you're in a place that you don't know, like I know Wayne, I could have done this without the map. I could have, you know, give me any address of Wayne and I'll, I'll be able to fly around with it. Um, you know, Totowa, same thing, Paquanic, same thing, Little Falls. Put me in, you know, um, put me in Upper Greenwood Lake. I'm like a lost puppy, right? And so I'll use the map and I'll really, the key is looking at the macro and then zooming into the micro. Yeah. That is so, because you want to paint the overall picture of what's going on. And you're like, okay, this is what's going on in your, in your neighborhood. This is what's going on. Like, here's what your neighbor's house sold for. Here's what this sold for. However, in the town, here's what's going on overall. 
Right. And it just, it, it ties it all in and it, it really makes you look like the expert in knowing what you're doing. So, um, so for next week, let's see. So, uh, so we're gonna put this all together. So we got some action plans here, but guys, you have any questions by all means, feel free to email me, Sean at AnnaRealEstate.com. Um, follow me on Facebook. I think I'm at Anna Real Estate or sold by Sean. Uh, Instagram, I'm at Anna Real Estate. Anything you guys need, I'm always here. I'm, I love answering questions. Um, guys, just make sure you're ready for next week, right? Develop that lead gen habit. I can't focus that. I really can't focus on that enough. And Eric over here, speaking of lead gen, whether it's making those calls every day, whether it's saying two days, three days, whether it's whatever, it's just super important to develop that habit because once you actually have that habit, it's hard, it's hard to kick the habit, right? Bad habits, good habits. Once you develop the habit, it's hard to kick it. So when you have that good habit, you know, you might as well adopt a habit that's empowering to you and that's empowering to your business. Um, and you know, guys, I got in this business when I was 22 years old. I had no idea what the heck I was doing. My first year in the business, I sold $10 million, right? And I, and I did it based on making phone calls every single day. I'm not saying that's the only way. I'm not saying that's the end all be all, but it gets you in the habit in looking for the business instead of being reactive and having the business look for you. That takes time to build. So I'm not even there yet. Um, I will leave you with that. Make sure your next class, please come prepared. And um, hopefully you guys had some value here today. Great yeah, stuff. For sure. Thank you. Thank you.